<laughs> Good everything. Hi. 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 Hi, Dr. Carr. Um, we were having a little uh discussion beforehand because um after <laughs> everything. Hold on, hold on. Hey. That's okay. Hey. Hold on, hold on. Stop it. Okay. <laughs> All right, tell me when. Tell me when. Hello, hey Nubians. Hello, folk in YouTube. Uh now you're muted. Okay. Okay. Yep. All right. We're gonna call up the app. All right, we'll wait. All right. I'm I back. Okay, good. I was saying that last week in Chicago, um, walking us through that museum with your laptop, I was like, <laughs> we can never do that. We have to have because no one does a museum like you. Mm -hmm. There's like no one that's gonna take us through. No one goes through. You got me on a going down a rabbit hole talking about Dunbar High School. Oh yeah. And I'm just I, I downloaded a book <laughs> this morning. Oh, first class is I don't know Allison. What's the name, Stewart? Allison. Oh, I never know the author. Uh, yeah, Allison Stewart. Allison Stewart. Uh, first yeah. class, the D legacy of Dunbar, America's <laughs> first black public high school, and I was kind of stuck on this. Um, you know, not just self determination, but like we've always kind of figured out what we needed. You know, in the face of you know oppression, in the face of black codes, in the face <laughs> of laws restricting movement, literal movement, you could be arrested just for not uh, being somewhere. <laughs> you know, it's like what? and for a group of black people uh illiterate black people a carpenter named george bell and two others who were skilled caulkers because everybody was skilled uh who came off of a plantation because that's how the, this country got built and a lot of other places you think about them building a school for their children because they, even though they were illiterate they wanted their children to learn and you just think about you know all the things we complain about now most of us aren't willing to do just the, the basics. I, I was having a conversation about uh, <laughs> right. Olympic. No, seriously, I was having a co conversation about Olympic and I'm not no shade to people who need it, but I'm like, you know, the the work that it takes uh, that is required for you to to um, not need uh, diabetes medicine, high blood pressure medicine, you know, the way in which you have to eat, the diet and exercise to now be able to just do a little shot and the weight just comes off. And I was like, I, I just feel like something, I don't know. I don't know. I was like, can it be that easy? You know, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. But, you know, the hard work. And then I look at, you know, where we are now with Dunbar, which is, you know, in disrepair and uh, all of the great. Which one? The Dunbar where? In D.C.? Oh, no. Dunbar in D.C. has a brand new building. Okay. All right. oh, yeah. now, I don't mean, I mean, I'm talking about, like, in terms of the 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 excellence of the the, the caliber of oh people. yeah no they, they, in fact you know yeah, I, spent, produce. I was talking about the physical building I, but I spent about. most of I spent most of uh of Tuesday down there with Nubia Garima Rogers and the Carter G Woodson Black Studies Cat you know that's my family too I'm, I'm very very close with them and with Dunbar High School they are doing some incredible things at Paul Lawrence Dunbar the the, the student body does not look like the student body of the golden, so-called golden age, of course, because the children there are like you and me now. They're not, they're not cream. They're not traveling from all over the country and getting an address in the neighborhood so they can go to Dunbar because at that time it's the M Street School, as you know, as we, we know, and we, as we've talked about extensively, it was the only high school in the country for us that would get you into college. In fact, it was the only high school in the country. So uh, okay. No, it's not. It's not that crowd now. That crowd that, at Dunbar now are the regular, same old regular black children. They go through uh, the same traumas, the same. They are assaulted by the same social structure system, and they have some incredibly. Look, I spent about thirty minutes on the second floor at Dunbar with a brother, Mr. Jackson, who's the art teacher. I'm telling. In fact, they're having an auction. I I'll talk more about that in a minute. But these young people. Just, just the artist of Dunbar High School. I'll talk more about that later. And then there's another brother who in the corner of the first floor has a bike shop, 70 plus mountain bikes that they build, that they fix. He Wait. runs the mountain bike team for DC public schools and Virginia and Maryland. They join, but it's run out of Dunbar. Those young people are mountain bikers. They walk in the building, they ain't never seen no mountain bike. And now they make them, fix them and travel all over the region. I'm saying, this, but, but it's not just Dunbar. I'm saying Dunbar is representative of a lot of people. And this is one of the reasons why Nubia is so important, because we got a lot of those people in Nubia. And by the way, they, they told me to tell you hello. They're in new people walking up to me. I'm a Nubia. And I'm saying, I didn't even know y'all was. I'm just saying the Dunbar of the, the so-called golden age doesn't exist anymore. 
But the Dunbar today is very aware of that, of that, of that, that legacy of that genealogy. And they say, now, what does that look like in the 21st century? And I, I bring it up because this, like your modern day reporting, you know, mm -hmm. like even I was like that Howard Washington thing. I was like, <laughs> that, 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 what do they call it? What is an autonomous, 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 autonomous,
there's only one time and one day when you can collectively have that experience. What is lost in that, do you think? Uh, community, which is why in Class with Car, I was just going to say, in Class with Car gives a hint to that because one day a week on a Saturday, the thousands of people experiencing something at the same time. No question. And having a conversation about it in real time. No and question. then, you know, maybe tomorrow, some, whoever misses it can come in. But this experience in the chat right now in Nubia is special, you yeah. know. Um, and it's very similar to that that is watching TV. Yes, yes, it is. I, I had to pull it up. That's why I was doing. I wanted to make sure. Uh, Letty said, "Glenn Terman, you know, set something off in the chat and movie with Glenn Terman. Look at him, different world." Ah, uh, Warren Harper, Dr. Warren E. Harper is the Nubian house with my African family. No question. Yes, yes. So there it is, and we see, and people are also, and as you always, you know, point out with the chat, people are filling in the footnote. Because what we're doing, you know, we, we when we talk extensively about Dunbar, and we'd have to go back into the archive to get the number, but, you know, and I showed everybody Mary Huntley's book on Dunbar, which is out of print, The Dunbar Story, and then mentioned Allison Stewart. And now, as you're going through Stewart, you see something that's very important and also very challenging. The important stuff is the history. We know that. And Stewart has a history with Dunbar, family history, community history. In fact, when that book came out, I went to see her. She was at Politics and Prose. She was in conversation around the book here in D.C. But the challenging thing is that like every other attempt to talk about our people that is grounded in a social structure lens, it creates the sense that this, that this is a show that went off the air, that it is over. And then we went off the cliff. No, that's a lie. Now, what did happen, and she chronicles this, is the challenges Dunbar went through in the 70s and the 80s. They've moved a couple of times, the new building. There was a whole war over the building that was built for Dunbar. And that's actually the building that's on the cover of Huntley's book. You see the build, you see the building there. This is Mary Huntley, who taught at Dunbar for many years. This is her book, The Dunbar Story. I put it in my lar because Wait, was she light skinned it? Yeah, she's an African, but she's an African who uh, actually had some co-mingling with a bunch of other stuff. No question. Yeah. <laughs> she is uh um, she went to Dunbar. It was M Street at then. Graduated cum laude. Taught for two years in Baltimore. Many years in Washington. Math, Latin, English, and French at Dunbar. Miners Teachers College, which the building is still there on the campus of Howard University. It's being renovated now. It's going to be the home of the Howard University Middle School. Uh, that's where all the teachers in D.C. If you're a black teacher in D.C. and went to school in D.C., you went to the Minor Teachers College. It has since been combined with the Washington Technical College and uh, one other school to become the University of the District of Columbia, which is actually the oldest HBCU in Washington, D.C. It's not Howard, it's, it's uh, UDC, which goes back to the 1850s. And uh, they have uh, a beautiful campus. In fact, I, I try to go over there every Wednesday before I go to Howard Law School, which is in the neighborhood. Um, she chaired Dunbar High School's College Bureau, 1943 to 1949. And so this book is about the graduates of Dunbar Beginning in 1870, when it was the college preparatory school, the M Street School on M Street in D.C., and then renamed, as we talked about, and, and I encourage everybody to go back into the archive. Again, it is so, we're in, we're in number 208 of our weekly conversations, and the archive we have, if we said nothing else about Dunbar this morning, and you went back into the archive, you get everything you need to get do a deep dive into Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School of Washington, D.C., and, and maybe I'll talk a little bit later about the conversation we had on Sunday night in Atlanta at the History Makers Pedagogy Conference. Shout out to uh, Juliana Richardson, founder uh, and, and center of the History Makers. And of course, our brother, the unparalleled historian of our people, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Kwaku Larry Franklin Crow. He and Mama Olabisi were there, of course, because they are it, it, essential to the History Makers work. Larry is, is the man. Talking about Paul Lawrence Dunbar, of the... I guess now close to 4,000 individual interviews, 150,000 separate vignettes in the History Makers database that have been uh, recorded and archived that are available through History Makers. And I encourage people to look at that, at that database, at that archive. Larry Crow has done over 2,000 of the interviews. So over half of the people interviewed for History Makers, Larry Crow has interviewed them. And, and so I'm only raising it because if you go into the, the, the History Makers uh, archive and type in the search term Dunbar High School, what you will then find is all the other Dunbars 
Paul Lawrence Dunbar of Chicago, Dunbar of Dayton, Ohio, Dunbar of Baltimore, which many people may know because of their basketball team, Muggsy Bowles and them came out of Dunbar. It was Dunbar in D.C. is the queen of the Dunbars. And the, the narrative around Dunbar is the same as the narrative around African people in the United States. We came through trauma. Oh, yeah, Africa. Okay, that's fine. We came through trauma. And then we fought our way through Jim and Jane Crow after enslavement, which we fought our way out of. And then we had these glory years of sorts, perhaps ending in the 60s and 70s. And then it's just been off the cliff ever since. And so it's difficult when you walk into a space like the beautiful new building of Dunbar, which is across the street from um, another high school, Armstrong High School. Armstrong is where Carter Woodson was the principal. Carter Woodson also taught at M Street, which is Dunbar, as did Anna Julia Cooper and Mary Church Terrell came out of Dunbar. I mean, so many people that came out of Dunbar. You talk about Charles Drew, Charles Hamilton Houston. We started naming it Benjamin Davis, uh, Ed Brook, Senator Brook, Dunbar graduate. I mean, all that. That is the easy part, the celebratory part. Then you come to Dunbar in 2024, you walk into an auditorium like I did on uh, Thursday morning for the Young, Dope, and Black annual Black History Month end of the month celebration. And shout out to everybody, all of those teachers in Dunbar, man. I love those people. Those women and men, those are my people in terms of just colleagues, educators. And when you come into an auditorium that seats hundreds and every seat is full with the students of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and you walk in and they've got a they got a Black History Month quiz bowl going. And, and every adult who went to an HBCU or who and who or or who pledged a Greek letter organization had to wear their gear. Most of the time I go down there, I go in my uh, throwback. Remember, East Coast African-American uh, college hoodie. You know, I'm just going to be, you know, because I believe it's one big HBCU with a bunch of different locations. I know people don't believe that, but I don't care because I know they are. And I'm sure some of the uh, anyway, I'm not going to say that. But at any rate. This time, though, I figured I'll put on my alpha hoodie because I don't wear a whole lot of uh, Greek letter paraphernalia. But I throw on my, 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 my 1906 joint. Why? Because Charles Hamilton Houston pledged Alpha Phi Alpha. And Charles Houston, the man who killed, who killed Jim Crow, was a Dunbar graduate. And so when I walked in, I saw Morgan and West Virginia State College. I saw uh, Hampton, of course. And, uh, of course, plenty of Howard there and Morehouse and Spelman. And then you saw the AKAs, the Iota Phi Thetas. You saw the, the Sigmas and the Deltas. Everybody is there. And these are all the adults. And, you know, Karen, I tell you, there's no more beautiful thing for me and for a lot of us when you walk into a school, you know, and, and what you see is you see the children because you see our future. And, in fact, at one point, we were asked, they did a couple of panels, and then in between they had the, the Dunbar Dolls, which is their dance dance group. They danced, and uh, and then they had everybody would get up and say, "Let's y'all do y'all steps. They're going to do a Greek letter step. I said, yeah, unless y'all going to take me to Howard Hospital right after this, I'm going to sit here and clap for y'all. Because <laughs> at 59, you know, I, I remember some of them steps, but uh, they work better in my mind than I think they do in my limbs. But <laughs> not, not that I wasn't almost on the verge. I said, I ain't going to get up and step. Y'all ain't tell me this out of stretch before I came in here this morning. But, but you have to go through a metal detector. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you know, the security is there. Good people. In fact, one of the brothers works for D.C. police is, is, is an alpha. He wore his stuff, you know. So he walked through. And you have to remember that there are many Dunbar students who, like many of our students around the country, have been assaulted by violence. Dunbar has been touched many times. They've had students lose their lives this year. You've had uh, students uh, who have been assaulted. Um, at one point, like I said, I was on the second floor with Mr. Jackson. We were looking at his art, his students' art, and his art. He is a working artist, and I mean a visual artist. In fact, uh, tomorrow night in office hours, I'm going to, uh, I'm sorry, Monday night in office hours, I'm going to pull some of the photographs I took so that you all can see the artwork of these students. In fact, if I can pull up one of them before we uh, get off today, Karen, I'm going to text it to you and okay. you can show. I just took a little bit of video because they've got something going on called Kaumba. So, and, say it again. And while you're doing that, I just wanted to let folks yeah, know. Let me, let me do that while, yeah, I'm going to look for it now. While you're while doing you're that, um, I wanted to let folks know if you are not a narrative, 
Um, and because a lot of people are in Nubia that and they don't spend a lot of time in narrative. But it, on the narrative uh, side, there is a bibliography that uh, is extensive. And I just went in there right now because I wanted to know which episode, Paul, you know, we talked about Dunbar High School. And so I went into narrative in the bibliography. There's a little search, a little, you know, hourglass or um, excuse me, magnifying glass. You, you type in I typed in Dunbar episode 67. Yes. Is where we we talked about it, and also I typed in Paul Lawrence Dunbar in episode one fifty four. We did a whole uh, piece on how do we educate, where we also talked about Paul Lawrence Dunbar. So uh, in Dunbar High School, and, and it's time stamped. So the extensive work. Uh, shout out to Ken and Ahmad that has been put into this bibliography, which I think is probably the coldest piece of work we got in narrative. I know that's right. If, if you aren't using the resources, because a lot of times we're like, where is such and such? And this is about to, to get even more extensive as we incorporate AI. Uh, we've been very um, gentle with jumping in because I am protective of our intellectual property. No question. Uh, the, the kinds of work, I mean, people steal all the time. They take stuff and then they put it on TikTok and, you know, that's all right, you know, because uh, you can't you can't produce it yourself. So uh, <laughs> stealing is is the most American thing. But as it relates to the future and a hundred years from now, 200 years from now, um, our intellectual property will not be usurped by, you know, uh, chat GPT or anybody else's uh, stuff. So we are keeping this very close to the vest. And if we do dive into an AI space, uh, we're going to control it uh, from the back end. So well, we already have uh, the makings of it uh, in narrative. So if you don't, you know, if you're not a part of it, you know, that's the only way to get to Nubia anyway. No question. No but question. You, utilize the resources because they're really powerful. Yes, man. In fact, I'm glad you said that because we have time. In fact, I just tried to email it to you. It's two minutes and a couple of things come to mind immediately. One is that <clears throat> when I go out like that, it never occurs to me to do a long kind of preview. I just go. And, you know, Nubia was like, you coming this year, right? And I said, how am I going to miss this? I always come to Young, Black, and Dope. I love it because the, the, these teachers, man, I tell you, they are the most incredible group of teachers. And I know that they are replicated all over the country because I spent a lot of time in schools and I worked at a school district in Philly. So I know that those teachers are there, which is why when I see people coming on uh, these uh, social structure shows or these educational experts talking about the problems in schools, I understand them too. And then they lift up the heroic teachers and the heroic students. And I say to myself, that's why we have to have an Africana studies lens because we have to talk about who we are to each other without these people interfering with our conversations. Because, hold on a second, let me see. I'm gonna put our clip here and I'm gonna try, I tried to send it with uh, an, an attachment. Okay. That it, it may have come, it may not have come. I just tried to send it again. So it, it may come through. But at any rate, because the, the name of Art Collective, I love this. I love this. Mr. Jackson, you the man. The The name of the art collective that they created at Dunbar High School is called Kuumba. It's the Kuumba Art Collective. And in fact, uh, Mr. Jackson is hooking up with some, with some of the artists at Howard University, in particular, two brothers who I told him I would make sure that I put him in contact with, James Phillips and, uh, and, and, and Baba Akili Anderson, Ron Akili Anderson, who are the two uh, members of Afrocobra, the African community of a relevant bad artists. I'm looking at the Afrocobra book up there on my shelf, but we talked about Afrocobra too in, 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 in narrative. I mean, in, in class and it's in the narrative archive. This was the black arts and is the black arts movement uh, artists who came together in Chicago, the wall of respect, See, Abdullah Kalamite's book on the wall. I ought to go over there and get it, but I ain't going to do it. I'm going to resist the urge. No, I'm not. I'll write, I'll write back. But at any rate, because now I can kind of get this stuff quickly. Y'all give me a second here. Give me third. But Afrocobra, the two artists, here we go. That was easy enough. So I can do it fast now. Wadsworth Jarrell, that is Afrocobra. They, 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 they're famous for what they call the Kool-Aid colors. Experimental art toward a school of thought. This is actually Wadsworth Jarrell's book on Afrocobra which includes uh, the wall of respect, which includes, you know, a lot of their art. I mean, you know, when you see the Afrocobra art, this is kind of unmistakable. Uh, that is uh, Nelson Stevens, the work, of course, of the great Nelson Stevens. There are very famous pictures in here as well. 
Here's one of uh, Wadsworth Jarrell's pieces, Three Queens. You see the art there from Afro Cobra, all concentrated on African people, black nationalist, pan-Africanist, just a beautiful, um, and the leader, of course, of Afro Cobra, who became the chairman of the art department at Howard University, uh, Jeff Donaldson out of Arkansas. Jeff Donaldson was uh, a visionary in many ways. He was part of the delegation that went over to Nigeria for Vestac in 1977, but just a, an incredible um, incredible person. Uh, this is Abdullah Kalamat, Romy Crawford, and Rebecca Zorak's book, The Wall of Respect, which was in Chicago, Public Art and Black Liberation in 1960 Chicago. There are other books on Afrocobra, but I thought I would just put a couple of them in your face because what Brother Jackson is doing, he is connecting these Dunbar students with two of the remaining figures from the Afrocobra movement, James Phillips and Akili Anderson, who teach at Howard. And so, you know, that synergy, there's always been a partnership between Dunbar High School of D.C. And, and Howard University, but this is a different type of partnership because the shift in the 1960s moved into the Black Power era. Um, I would encourage people, if you get a volume edited by Claudia Tate, T-A-T-E, entitled Black Women Writers at Work, it's been republished now. There's an, an interview in there with Claudia Tate, who's an ancestor now, and another ancestor now, the great Tony K. Bambara, on the meaning of the 1960s and the 1970s. They're, 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 she's being interviewed in the 80s. And that's one of the things they're talking about. And what Tony K. talks about is how the 60s is known for organizing and protest and manifestos and in your face and confrontation. She said the 70s seemed to be more introspective. There seemed to be more of an emphasis on the individual and development. But she said, I don't think it was any less important I don't think it was any less important. I think that what we have is a challenge of seeing ourselves in time and space and seeing how things connect. And so that important distinction has to be brought up when we start talking about our people in terms of that sixth category of our Africana Studies framework, movement and memory. For folks who are new and there are new people coming every week, into this space and for folks who aren't new because we're about to start the Africana Studies course again, the revised, listen to what worked the first time, what do we need to add course, which will probably start um, near the end of March because uh, Monday night in office hours, we are going to uh, debrief, continue to debrief with Whither Now and Why with Dr. Du Bois. And then the following week, we're gonna preview the course. So it might be three weeks we do. It'd probably be not this Monday, but for the following Monday, but the Monday after that, when we start our new iteration. But as I said, for folks who are new, we, uh, oh, Mike says the name of the book. I'm not sure. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. People are talking about book, the book that came out in by one of the Nubians, I think. Uh, Sir Smart Museum of Art Exhibition, The Time Is Now. Ah, yes, yes. Oh, that reminds me. There's another great one right up there. It's called Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power. Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power. That's a good one, too, in terms of the bibliography and a lot of the images from that period. But as I said, as Tony Cade is being interviewed, she's talking about this question of continuity and how we see ourselves in time and space and how these eras connect. When we think about social structure, uh, and by social structure, I don't just mean whiteness. I mean, whatever the society structure is, social structure we find ourselves in in any given moment and what we've experienced over the last several centuries is a global social structure that has been disproportionately impacted by human beings who lived in western eurasia we could call it the age of europe if you want or the eurocentric age that age was never completely dominant and now it is receding more rapidly every day well in this period that we've been experiencing experiencing over the last several centuries we find ourselves anchored far too often to numbers, to dates. This is Jacob Carruthers again in his important 1972 essay, Science and Oppression, which remains in our Africana Studies framework when we discuss the category, the fourth conceptual category in our sixth conceptual category framework, science and technology. It is Dr. Carruthers who reminds us that this kind of ordinal classification, this ranking methodology where you try to order all of human beings like there's a list with a number one and a number 40, or that there's a, a sense of progress that is inevitable. The past is not as good as the present and the present isn't as good as the future by a kind of conceptual framework. And, and so you go forward and backward. Well, when you think about it that way, it becomes 
a challenge to think about the students of Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School today in the context of the students and faculty of Paul Lawrence Dunbar in 1940 or 1920 or 1880 or 1960 and think about them as part of an unbroken continuity because we often frame their experiences in a social structure narrative. Who are they to other people? So we're looking for super achieving Negroes. We're looking for first Negroes to do this in this social structure. We're looking for the kind of superhuman Negroes. And then we talk about the senses of community and the sense of connection, but we do it almost like an afterthought in some ways or as a means to an end. And the end being this kind of representative Negroes into the bloodstream of American narrative. Well, that obscures in many ways the governance category. Again, as those six categories emerge, social structure, who are Africans to other people, governance, who are Africans to each other, that can obscure who we are to each other. And what I experience every time I'm in Dunbar High School is who we are to each other. I mean, we're up on second floor looking at this art that I hope y'all be able to see in a moment or a little bit later, so just a glimpse. And, you know, we heard a commotion right over the lunchroom. Jackson said, oh no, he listening, I'm listening. He said, are they fighting? This happens all the time in high schools, right? But by the time he says it almost, the noise goes down. We resume. Because, you know, you got to know, you got to have, we, we call it, you know, those of us who are teachers and probably, you know, you like I, you know, when you're in a room, you call it teacher's ears or teacher's eyes. You ask a question, don't make a muscle if you don't want to be called on because you're like, wait, oh, I saw you move. Oh, no, no, I was just scratching my head. No, you can't move after I ask a question because I got teacher's eyes. I'm looking for somebody to move. You hear, you hear students, if they get loud for a moment, and then subside, are they laughing? Are they clowning each other? Are they getting ready to fight? You can you can tell the difference. Uh, you hear paper start rustling near the end of class. Or you hear somebody and you say, oh, it must be time to go. How much time we got, about five minutes? Yeah, we got five minutes. How did you know that? Teacher's ears. I heard the paper rustling. So, I mean, you start you start understanding how to, to be in that environment. All that is who we are to each other. And I thought it was important that not only we take a moment to emphasize that, but that we take this moment, this opportunity, this point of entry, uh, somebody's car alarm going off, hope it doesn't bother y'all too much. Somebody's point of entry, uh, they turn it off good, to, uh, to, to emphasize those conceptual categories we'll be going back into when we start the Africana Studies class again in several weeks. Uh, social structure, who Africans are to other people, governance formation, who we are to each other, ways of knowing, the ways we understand ourselves and reality that we have developed or adapted or come into over time and space at any particular moment, we'll be looking at that. Science and technology, how have we created or adapted tools to engage each other and the world through science and technology, uh, the cultural meaning making, what songs, what uh, art, what ways of creating cultural texts and practices have we developed in any given moment or used to interpret our and mark our time as we come through this life. And then finally, movement and memory. Movement and memory, of course, is how do we string all of those memories together? That's why, uh, Prof, when you came up with the, what music did you listen to when you cleaned up your house? That is a movement and memory conversation because it's not only the cultural meaning making of the moment. It's not only putting on Aretha or, or Stevie Wonder or Earth, Wind & Fire or Fela Kuti or Miriam McCabe or Bob Marley. It's not only putting that music on in that moment. Those memories then evolve over time so that new generations who you're introducing to, you know, your love deserves an encore. Some of them, many of them will, have, will be hearing that for the first time. But many young people know that music as if they were themselves there when the music came out because generations before them have played that music around them their whole lives. It never ceases to encourage and inspire me when young people start singing every word of Marvin Gaye or Stevie Wonder or every word of Diana Ross and the Supremes and know all the Jackson's songs and all know what you weren't even here. No, but somebody in your household played it or somebody in your community played it. And you then associate that with cultural meaning making in your time and space, but it is going over time, movement and memory as we go through. So this week, we, you know, going to Dunbar on Thursday was the culmination of really a whirlwind week. As we, as you say, Prof, we were in Chicago on Friday night. And I encourage you all, if you go to the DuSable Museum's uh, Facebook page, and I'm not on Facebook, but DuSable 
streamed the conversation that Dr. Kim Delaney, director of education programs at Dunbar and I had. And it was a beautiful thing. The community was there. Reverend Wright was there. The people from the Comedic Institute were there. It was so beautiful to have everybody there. A lot of Nubians were there. I mean, a lot of Nubians were there. And so it was good to have everybody there. And as I talked about on Saturday, when we got together on Saturday morning again for in class, it was from the auditorium that we had been in the night before. And when I got off, as you saw, we were headed to the day long teaching around the Africana Studies framework. And the first half of the teaching was around the language of African people, cultural meaning making and ways of knowing. Cultural meaning making and ways of knowing. Language allows us to create texts and practices, cultural meaning making. It allows us to communicate our ways of knowing. And the first half of that conversation we had, the teaching we had all day at Dunbar, was led by uh, our sister Kim Delaney, who showed a small documentary on um, Ebonics, which is a fascinating thing, which sparked a real important conversation we needed to have about the languages of African people. And as we then did a working lunch and moved into the conceptual categories, it moved effortlessly and seamlessly. In fact, what happened on Saturday all day at Dunbar, I went, I mean, at, at, at DuSable, and I thought about that because I didn't put in my bag um, Roman Feldman's uh, books on Dunbar. These are the, these are the, this is two volumes. Actually, I, I'll show you the first one. This is called, and I talked about this a couple of years ago, actually, if you go type in uh, DuSable Museum, this is figures in Negro history. It's edited by him. Uh, this is a white dude who was actually on the board of what was called the Ebony Museum initially by Margaret Burroughs and Charlie Burroughs. And we talked about Margaret Burroughs and Charlie Burroughs and the DuSable Museum, which began as the Ebony Museum in their home. And I might have put Linda Holmes's book on Margaret Burroughs. At, no, no, there's one called Southside Venus. I think about 20K Bombara. Southside Venus might have, oh, there, there we go. Southside Venus, that's crazy. It's right there. This is a book that came out recently, uh, Southside Venus, The Legacy of Margaret Burroughs by Marianne Kane. Uh, Haki, Baba Haki Mahabudi wrote the foreword. Haki Mahabudi, of course, he and Mama Safisha Mahabudi uh, with Third World Press. Uh, this is the great Margaret Burroughs, who y'all saw in the, um, this is her, you saw in the uh, mosaic in the foyer of the DuSable Museum. I mean, everybody from Gwendolyn Brooks. And in fact, let me, <laughs> Since Haki wrote the uh, wrote the forward, there's Haki Mahabudi with Margaret and Charlie Burroughs right there. Very important. And this, of course, is the Southside Community Arts Center, one of the two institutions that she started, the other one being DuSable Museum. Um, so it was just a blessing to be. This is the house, the first site of the DuSable Museum. There's Margaret Burroughs in front of the house where the, where the Ebony Museum started. And I mentioned that in the context because at the time that this book, Figures in Negro History, was published, this book uh, was published by, and by that time they had changed the name to the Museum of Negro History and Art. At that time, it's on 30, 3806 South Michigan Avenue. And the artists here have, uh, in fact, in fact, I pulled this out during the couple of sessions we had on John Brown. There's a lithograph of John Brown and then there's a discussion of John Brown. This figures in Negro history. But by the time, see, if you want, to, you want a copy of this, you had to write to the Museum of Negro Art, History and Art, 3806 South Michigan Avenue, Chicago, 53, Illinois. Now, this is a, a, a more, this is the same book, but it's a new edition, Figures in Black History. This one, by the time they published this one, they changed the name. Issued by the DuSable Museum of African American History. Same address. And now, if you want to order, you get the DuSable Museum of African American History. They changed the DuSable, which is the name they have to this day. We put these back because I don't like to move stuff around too much. People think, oh, those books, I have books in different places that have, and in fact, I want to reshell Southside Venus because I need to leave, I need to remember exactly where I put it. All right. That having been said, on Saturday, we talked about black language. And the conversation was so rich, so powerful, because at a key moment in the documentary, you have all these experts, linguists, 
he had politicians because one of the things it covers was the so-called controversy that took place among social structure politicians and academics and talking heads and white nationalists looking for an excuse to fight black people. Back in uh, the 90s, there was a sister named Tony Cook, who's now an ancestor, and others out in the Bay Area, the Oakland School Board was developing through the schools and the teachers ways of having young people, native Ebonic speakers, who speak ebony sounds, Ebonics, a linguist might call it African-American vernacular English or African-American English. And we've talked about the linguist Lisa Green and many others, John Rickford, so many others have showed so many of those grammars who speak that language or speak variations of the language because we know that Ebonics, Ebony Phonics, as it was coined by Robert Williams and those in the Association of Black Psychologists in the early 1970s, it means black sounds. So there are Ebonics in Spanish and Dutch, French, Portuguese, English, any of these slave master languages that were stuffed into our mouths, we were able to Africanize enough of them to retain some sense of grammatical structure, some sense of the sounds, the phonology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In other words, using all of our ways of knowing and cultural meaning making to absorb those languages into some of our structures and create something new, Ebonics. And there are those who call it broken English. So we had this conversation using the conceptual categories and I raised a, a question for us to, to think about and say, let's let's stipulate, although it seems to me that a, a car crash language like English, car crash between the Germanic languages and the Latin based languages, it's already broken. You know, languages break, cultures bleed, so they're gonna change. If you wanna call it broken English in a social structure lens, fine. I'm not gonna argue with you. Because again, our objective, as we've read, set with Du Bois over the last two and a half months, culminating Monday night with whither now and why, is to destroy oppressive systems, to make sure that equity and equality are at the center of our human enterprise, regardless of where we live in the world. And in race-based societies, that means making sure that everybody has access to the same services, everybody has protections in the same way. But that is as a means to an end, as Du Bois reminds us in Whither Now and Why. The means to the end for us is then to have members of the human family contribute to the human family their own unique experiences, cultural experiences, political experiences, so that you can enhance the human family. What Du Bois is telling those, those educators at Johnson C. Smith University in April 1960 is I'm not trying to disappear as a culture. I'm not trying to lose myself what we should be doing is destroying Jim and Jane Crow, destroying apartheid, destroying segregation, so that we can make the kind of contributions to contemporary society that Africans have made since the beginning of humanity. And that is the objective. Those two things get commingled. you understand? But as we were talking, so, so if you want to call it broken English and these white supremacist social structures, you know, we'll fight that fight. But that's not at the center of our work. The center of our work is self-determination. Is, 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 is autonomy, is a form of almost sovereignty in a sense, standing in our own space, speaking to the world without restriction. So I said, well, we had a brother there whose people are actually from Congo. And this brother, very interesting, professor, has, has, has a doctorate. This brother, it's interesting, he has traced his family back to at least two human beings who were on the white line and that other ship that got jacked from the Spanish by the English and taken into Port Comfort, what is now Virginia, in August 1619. Talk about a 1619 project. But this brother's not approaching 1619 from a social structure sense. He's approaching it from governance and he is a trained sociolinguist. So he started talking about how the cultures of African people in the languages that we brought with us, that we then used as bases to exchange our country marks with each other, as Michael Gomez might say. Michael Gomez, of course, the great historian who Larry Crow actually interviewed this, uh, this past weekend in Atlanta while we were there for the history makers. As he says, exchanging our country marks, learning each other's languages enough and then being pressed into having to combine our grammars, combine our loan words and, 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 and vocabulary as, as French was stuffed in our mouth, as Portuguese was French stuffed in our mouth, as English was stuffed in our mouth, as Spanish was stuffed in our mouth. So as we did that, 
you know, this, what this brother is tracing is the echoes of language that continue through that change over the arc of time as we have experienced these traumas and how our resistance to those traumas in forms of cultural meaning making have allowed us to retain some sense of self despite the assaults. So we're having this conversation. And I asked him after I asked him to walk us through how he would approach this question of Ibiza. Let me ask you a question, brother. Here with everybody here. And we, we had a full crowd all day on Saturday. I said, let me ask you. If, if they're calling it broken English in the English variations on Ebonics, could we even imagine approaching the way we speak, the way we move, the way we use full spectrum ways to communicate? Because it isn't just the words that come out of your mouth. It isn't just the English words, the vocabulary words that we bring in and repurpose, like ashy or sometimey, or words that we create to give us a sense of the way of knowing we're trying to to communicate like sadity instead. Well, it's it's also the way we move. Uh, I know it. Stop talking. Talk to the hand. Boom. We don't have to say talk to the hand. You speak a bunch, you know what that is. You know what sounds mean when you say something. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. 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 The, it's the sounds. It's the movements. It's the vocabulary that we bring in. It's the way we repurpose. It's the words we brought for ourselves, whether it be banjo or goober, we bring in from the other languages. I said, so could we perhaps imagine approaching the ways that we speak in the contemporary world when we've learned these European languages and then adapted them to our purposes? Could we speak as if perhaps there are echoes of broken Yoruba, broken Ibibio, broken Ibo, broken tree? Broken Wolof, broken Ovumbundu, broken Kikongo. He said, I think that might be possible. Whether it's possible or not, Africana studies is the space where we ask that question and then pursue it. And here are going to people with the French and the German. Yeah, but you can do it. Hold on. We'll get back to that conversation. Because what you're not going to do is drag us back into the intellectual battlefield of a fight with you. We're trying to, we've already contributed to humanity. We're now going to document that contribution to strengthen our capacity to make further contributions. This is the life work of W.E.B. Du Bois. So Saturday was, was a, was a special moment. As we know, as I talked about last Saturday, before that, we were down, we were all down at Columbia, um, Columbia, South Carolina at, at Benedict College. And we, we talked about that. In fact, you know, everyone, I count myself as incredibly fortunate, incredibly fortunate to have come through the commingling of the bloodlines of my father and mother, like all of us, to be here. Had no, had no, nothing to do with getting here, but just being blessed to have been around and, and fortunate to have been around the type of elders and, and now ancestors, many of them, and community folk who are committed, who are committed to our people. And so being with so many of those folk in, in, in Columbia on uh, Tuesday night and part of Wednesday morning was just transformative for me again. You know, I love everyone down there, Kathy Adams, of course, and and Bernie Gallman and um, everybody, Jerome Boykin, everyone, all the people there, the Catalyst Mbangi, uh, the folks at, 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 at Benedict College, of course, Vernon Orr and everyone there. And being in community with them, so many Nubians came, as I said, from other cities. But that allowed me, and I count myself fortunate because spending that time with Cecil Williams. Oh, Cecil Williams. I got his books in the other room. I'm not going to go get them. I am going to resist that urge uh, because I couldn't show them to you last week because I was still traveling. But I brought the books back. At any rate, I brought the books back and then going to Chicago. But I got to see Cecil Williams, thanks to Kathy, on Tuesday, go through the Cecil Williams Museum in South Carolina, and there's an extensive website. He developed it during COVID. You can go see for yourself, the Cecil Williams Museum. And then on Sunday night in Atlanta with the history makers, got to sit for a minute with my man, Jim Alexander. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. But Jim Alexander is the great photographer in Atlanta. And I told him I had just left Cecil Williams. I said, I'm the only human being who gets to say that. And that's not even a privilege. What is the privilege 
is not only the privilege isn't me being able to have that experience. The privilege is to be here Saturday after Saturday and then in narrative seven days a week and in Nubia. And for me in office hours, that's my shift so far. We're going to add some stuff because we are going to do a critical race theory class on Monday nights for two hours and bring that to everyone. Because there's somebody in here who had never heard those names, who now knows those names. If you are a photographer, you need to know those names. Also a brother right here. And in fact, I could hit the trifecta maybe if I go through Sankofa today and having a cup of coffee with his camera always at his side, I run into the great Roy Lewis. At that point, I'm like, these are three of the greatest photographers living on the earth. I saw two of them last week and I could see Roy Lewis today. I would have hit the trifecta because I see Roy pretty regularly in DC. If it's something black going on, you usually gonna see Roy Lewis with his hat on taking a photo. In fact, I didn't see Roy yesterday. I'm going to check on Roy. I need to call Roy because I didn't see him yesterday at Howard University's Charter Day convocation. It is the Charter Day season. Morehouse just had theirs. Um, uh, Howard had theirs yesterday. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But at any rate, this experience in Chicago then emptied into what uh, I was able to do on Sunday and Monday in, in Atlanta. The History Makers is a very important digital archive. It is an oral history archive. Thousands of interviews with African people, various folk. I want to, uh, I sat on Sunday night with a number of people, my dear friend, Andrea Gavins Jackson, who uh, for many years has worked at, she's an archivist and a librarian who has worked for many years at the Woodruff Library. Y'all know the Atlanta University Center, the Woodruff Library there. And now she heads up a, a, a consortium, an HBCU consortium that is digitizing work. Remember that little uh, day late millions and billions of dollars short report that Harvard did, which we talked about in class and went through the report actually uh, when it came out it was last year, year before last year. And uh, one of the things that they recommended in the report is that they give a few dollars to, you know, the Negroes. And so they've given a few dollars to this project. But one of the things I like about it is Andre explained it to me because it's my first time seeing her after they started this. I hadn't seen her in a while. The last time I saw her actually was because when she put on the Asa Hilliard um, conference down in Atlanta, we talked about that when we had in class. You can go back and find that in the archive as well. But uh, Andrea is heading that up, and they're, 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 they are getting black colleges, at the black college archives and libraries to collaborate with each other to share their archives and resources, retaining the physical copies where they are, but contributing to a, a, to a, to a larger digital archive that they control. I always like that. I, I mean, that's important that we have control, as you say, uh, Karen, intellectual property. And so we talked about that. I asked her some questions about intellectual property and things like that. And I was very glad to be sitting there at the table I was at with her. And next to me, uh, Dr. Dr. Gavins, the former head of the Morehouse School of Medicine and Jim Gavins. And sitting with this brother, as he told us stories, he, he was one time on Emory's Board of Trustees. He's one of the history makers who has been interviewed. And I mean, just a beautiful brother. And for me and his brother to sit here, man, me to listen to this elder tell stories about growing up in Alabama and, and, and going off to medical school and having, as he visited his Nana in Alabama, you know, you go, he said, we, as she got older, she was the community pillar. You know, everybody came around, you know, she cooked, she, she, she had community, she brought people together. And then he said, I was little, I got there one day and she wasn't moving. She was in the bed. She didn't have as much energy. And I looked and below her knee, her leg was gone, right leg was gone. And I was like, man, what has happened? And then, and then the next time I saw her, she was even weaker. And both her legs were going beneath the knee. He said, I was 25 years old. I had, fin I had gotten a research fellowship. I think it was the National Institute of Health. First black person to, to get this research fellowship. Now, according in the social structure, he's the first, he's one of the, he's one of these first Negroes. First do this, first do that. First, he is one of the uh, acknowledged authorities in the country on the question of diabetes. And he said, I was 25 years old when I realized that what my Nana was calling the sugar, that was diabetes. He said, I did not accept the fellowship. I went and applied for and enrolled in medical school and the rest is history. He went from his graduate work to an MD. And Jim Gavins is one of the most important researchers, scholars in the area, particularly of diabetes, and then ended up heading the Morehouse School of Medicine, sits on Emory board, uh, trustee emeritus of Emory. And I'm sitting there with this brother, but you know what he was at me that moment? 
he's an elder. This is a governance conversation we were having. Oh, we laughed about so many things. He told he told us the story of how at 14 years old, he almost died in Alabama in a, in a Greyhound bus station when he tried to buy a ticket. And he said the cost was like 47 cents or something to get to the next stop he was going to. And the white woman in the at the bus station wouldn't sell him the ticket. And how at that moment, he insisted he needed to get where he was going. She called the cop and here come the sheriff, put a gun to his head and say, you know, I can kill you right now. Nothing would happen to me. Kind of like 2024. And it was very moving as we sat there and he just, and you could see him going back to that 14 year old boy. But this brother, talk about ways of knowing, this brother with this powerful spirit, as he told us the story and how he evaded it, how at that moment, the, the Greyhound driver, the white boy came into the bus station and how he just followed the guy out because he said, uh, next stop, we went. he just followed him out, got on the bus. Now he he couldn't buy he couldn't buy the ticket at the window. The white one called the police on him. He got on the bus as the cop is trailing him, and he gets on the bus. He said, "Man, look, I couldn't buy the ticket here. Could I buy the ticket? I, I know I ain't so." And the white boy, the bus driver, said, "Give me the money." Took the money, put it in his pocket, and they they took off. I said, "Man, you had to think quite fast." He said, "Yeah." He said, "But the reason I was in that little town is because I was coming back from seeing my girlfriend." And we all bust out laughing. How can you laugh in the moment of tragedy? These, this is Africans. Now, in the social structure, they would say, see, they triumph. No, go to hell. This is ways of knowing. This is quick thinking teenagers. This is being African in a hostile territory. And at the end, you laugh about it because you escape. Because the fools in that story are the lady at the window and that punk ass cop who is daring, who is the man that killed George Floyd, the, the men who killed Breonna Taylor, and the men who hunted Ahmed Aubrey. They're all the same man. But we're not going to live our lives as figments of these white imaginations. We have to at some point commit to a different kind of world. And sitting there with Jim Gavis, I'm like, brother, I'll tell you one more quick story about it because this kind of brings us together, social structure and governance structure. He said he was doing his, I think it was his residency. If I'm wrong about that, you know, uh, Reba Kelsey will tell me later. Dr. Kelsey, who was at the Morehouse School of Medicine, she's assistant dean over there. He said, I think, she, I think he was a resident resident. He said, we're in, the, we're in the emergency room, me and my boy, not too many black doctors. So we're going through our thing. We young doctors. He said, my man's told me this story. He's pushing this white woman in a wheelchair toward, it might've been surgery, some type of emergency intervention. And the white woman realizes a black dude pushing her. She says, I don't want no end to operate on me. I don't want no N word to operate on me. He says, my buddy, bends down to her ear and says, then you gonna die. That was the end of it. She went through with the procedure. Why? He said, oh, no problem. Then you gonna die. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very simple. You understand? So I mean, but he was full of stories like that, sitting there in community with him, just thinking about that and thinking on the weekends and on Mondays, I get to bring some of that here and connect us as well to the resources that have us connect to each other, like the History Makers database. Who are we to each other? And so it's important for us to, 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 to acknowledge that. And again, thinking about you know Larry and Ola BC and just being able to spend some time with them, and it's very important for us to do that. But the, the thesis of all that, and we could talk more about that as we go on, is us being human fully human in the world. This is what Du Bois was writing about and giving that talk in North Carolina about us being fully human in a world. It requires sacrifice and it requires stands. And when it becomes difficult, do it anyway. In the Young Black and Dope conversation we were having at Dunbar with all these folks who had come to be with the young people, to be with the teachers and staff, the principal, the faculty, sitting there just having conversations. One of the things that was raised was you know, those of you who haven't applied, you're some seniors in here who haven't applied to college. We still thinking about going to college? Sure. Community college or Howard or UDC or any place else. Are you thinking about, okay, it's not too late. And if you don't think you can get in, do it anyway. Apply anyway. It's very important to have these conversations. We have to do it anyway. We have to do it anyway. So I thought what we would do today, just for a few minutes, is, is approach that question of being committed or uncommitted. Because it takes commitment to do that. It takes commitment. And it's not a sacrifice to be in community with each other. It only becomes a sacrifice when we think of how the societies that we live in have been structured in a way to prevent us to being with, from being with each other and developing our full human potential. 
because, okay, I got to sacrifice. I got to take a, a lower salary to work in this job. If I'm going to be a teacher, it's not considered an honored profession. Uh -uh. It's not a sacrifice. It is a pleasure, a joy. It doesn't mean we don't get fatigued. It doesn't mean that we're not, you know, we're, that we're respected in the same way. And I want to talk a little bit about that as well. But today I thought that, and let me just take a moment here and check the chat for folks. Good. They're putting some uh in the Nubia chat, I see folks putting museum information in. Um, you went to see Lumumba, Death of a Prophet. Okay, good, good. I know they made a film of that as well. Um, oh, there's Larry. Thank you, Larry. Had a fantastic lit time last Saturday at DuSable. Doc and Kim Delaney kept us in tune and educated. Much love from the shy. Listen, man, love the shy. By the way, uh, I had a young brother from Chicago, a senior biology major who dropped by my critical race theory class on uh wednesday night at the law school because i let the undergraduates come and sit in sometime and uh afterwards he said to me anthony i think is his name he said oh, well i asked him when he came here where are you from he said chicago i said i just came back from your city and i and, and he said yeah man i said but they moving black folk out your city you can't move all the negroes out of chicago can he? he said no i said you seen that obama uh, presidential library space? He said, yeah, man. He started talking about the politics of displacement. Those of you who know Chicago, West Side Chicago, Hyde Park in particular, the University of Chicago campus in particular, you know where that is. And, and when we drove by there on Saturday after we finished, just before dark, I'm like, my God, they have taken up the entire... And of course, two days later, I was going past the Carter Presidential Library in Atlanta. And, and thinking about these presidential libraries, we're talking about movement and memory. We're talking about structures that allow people to promote themselves across time and space and take the society with them. We have to have physical spaces. And I, I just mentioned that in passing because thank you for, for mentioning that. Oh, good, good. Thank you, Lara Bradford, for putting Southside Venus in the chat. Very good. Oh, and thank you for putting, uh, Brother Anthony, thank you, or Sister Anthony, thank you for putting the link to the Facebook live conversation we had that is on the DuSable page. I'm assuming something similar is going on in the YouTube chat. Oh yeah, Ella, thank you. So good, Doc. I love the story connections. Us being fully human in the world that hates us. Yes, we have to be fully human in the world and it does require commitment, but that commitment is a joy. It should not be considered a burden. It's only considered a burden when we don't build a critical mass of people to intervene. So I thought today would be a good moment to bring up committee or uncommitted because we saw what happened in Michigan on Tuesday. In fact, uh, Prof, I was listening to the conversation you had with uh, Brother Don Calloway and Professor uh, Caritha Mitchell on this. And that was very interesting because, you know, when you're in a situation where there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and there's no right answer all the time. Remember, I was in South Carolina. In fact, uh, Brother Cecil Williams is very good friends with Jim Clyburn. And, it, and people got a lot of smoke with Jim Clyburn, including me. But it's complicated because Jim Clyburn has gotten a million plus dollars for Cecil Williams to expand the museum. And in South Carolina, particularly places like Columbia, I mean, and, and, I, and in fact, got a, a chance to because one of the people who came Tuesday night for our conversation was Mignon Clyburn. And so I was talking with Mignon about that. I'm saying, you know, it's complicated. You can't. Yeah, I was going to say, I only popped in to say, you know, in real time, I was working through live on the radio, not how I feel because yes. again, you know, emotions are, you know, you have knee jerk reactions and I want to encourage everyone to take a step back from your emotions and your yes. feelings and project yourself into the future of what needs to happen. You know, yes. we're going to create the world we want to live in what needs to happen right now. And I get, I get all of the outrage and disgust of what's going on in the Gaza Strip for uh, Representative Talib, it is personal. Man. She literally has family members that are dying right now in the Gaza Strip and she has lost people. It's personal. So that uncommitted vote was one of the only things she felt she could do in a, in a primary. In a primary where Joe Biden is the only person pretty much on the ballot. But I was thinking broadly of how it gives people an out to not show up in the general. And because, you know, I, I'm just going back um, in 2015, 2016, during the primary, I came up with this party of Lincoln concept on the radio. And it was just, I was spitballing in real time. I was like, hmm, I just found out 
at my big age that there were open state, open primary states and closed primary states. And Absolutely. that your party affiliation could switch and then we could in mass impact the Republican Party. Absolutely. Because I knew from New York Daily News, New Jersey, that Trump could win the primary. And if he won the primary, he would win. I just I just knew it. And I said, anybody but him, you know, and I had been talking with, you know, a bunch of people behind the scenes. Is there a candidate that we could live with if for some ungodly reason they made it through somebody that we could actually have a conversation with and beat into submission? So mm. I was having that conversation. Right. And so I said, Party Lincoln, if you are in one of these states and then I used that Cochran, I think in Mississippi as somebody who you know, had a runoff and he asked people, you know, black folk really to show up for him. That's right. Doug, Doug Jones. We saw that as well. Black people That's right. crossed party lines, uh, not right. in that case, but, you know, showed up in for people that we don't necessarily have an alignment with personally, but it was strategic. Right. So I was like, what's the strategy? I got, I got called so many names, Dr. Carr, <laughs> my people are People on my team, there was such a visceral, I could never register as a Republican. And I was like, it's strategy. It, I'm not asking you to change your, your whole entire worldview. I'm saying for this moment, it's strategy. Can we do that? And the answer was no. Wow. So at, wow. That, point, at that point, I realized, you know, when you talk about committed and uncommitted, the sacrifice that you have to take to remove yourself from what you believe strongly in your spirit to project into the future what people need away from you, right? Right. Can we do that? Can we do that? So even having that conversation, I was like weighing in real time. I get what she's doing. I get it with every fiber of my being. But what impact is just like, you know, all of the folk out there having alignments because you want to hold power accountable but yeah. right now, right now, there's so many uninformed people that don't even know basic civics. You gonna throw that into the mix? It's like, well, I'm uncommitted. In November, they're gonna be uncommitted, and I'm like, ah, what? How's this gonna end? And I'm, you know, maybe it needs to end. <laughs> I don't know, you know, Dr. Carr, because I'm struggling with that too. Maybe it needs to end. Maybe we need to see the worst. Oh, 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 it's gonna end. It's gonna end. Yeah. It's gonna end. Yeah. Um, I mean, but the question is, on what we, terms? Let me ask: Are we so used to pain and suffering that we are okay with the prospect of it? I well, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me say that I'm never okay with pain and suffering, and I know you aren't either. And that it might be, it's probably inevitable in the sense that what we are facing is so so massive, and it didn't happen overnight, right? And, you know, but, and. and, and but, but, Cause, Cause, there's some people. Oh, it's like Chicken Little. You always say, you know. Oh, well, sure. We, well, sure. we keep um, rescuing folks. So, how would you, you know, well, how would let you me, know? Let me, let me, let me, let me. I'll say this, and, and and people in both chats are saying, are asking, can we have a conversation? And I saw even when you posted a little clip of it on YouTube, people are coming in. I, and I, let me just say, without, let me just say this. Looking in Zap uh, on today's New York Times front page of the Times and all the papers, really, you know, Biden and Tom, and they're gonna do an airlift and 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 send food into and and super and supply. They have, they have already. Uh, in this part, uh, folk had to swim out in the ocean. They were fighting. I mean, exactly. It was so, it was so brutal to watch the dignity exactly. of people who are hungry and thirsty and desperate, exactly. and they drop a little MRE and then miss the mark. So folk right. had to swim out. And, well, instead of instead of confronting Bibi Netanyahu, let me be very clear about this. People, well, let me let me let me start. Let me just start with this. I do not know Representative Talib. Met her a couple of times, but don't know her. She wouldn't know me from Adam. The last time I saw John Conyers in alive was the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America conference the Encobra Conference in Detroit in the summer of 2019. Joanne Watson, one of the major figures, now an ancestor, she and John Conyers, now ancestors. Joanne Watkins, who fought for many years for reparations and beyond, a, a major figure. And of course, there are a lot of people who are ancestors now who weren't then. Of course, my Sharika Juwanza, me and first in my mind, of course, a stalwart, the female co-chair of Encobra at the time. That Sunday, there was a, a, a church 
gathering where you know all the reparationists went over that's because that saturday night we had all been with the minister the nation of islam took saturday night at in cobra and by the way shout out to the nation of islam just passed savior's day last week as i mentioned last saturday when i was um in the airport in columbia leaving to come back to dc i ran into a couple uh, the sister is a captain in the mgt the muslim girls in training uh, the brother, uh, faithful members uh, of the Nation of Islam, they were headed to Detroit for Savior's Day, the same Wednesday I was coming back to D.C. So they just finished Nate Savior's Day, minister now 91 years old, Mr. Farrakhan. The, the Muslims had taken Saturday and Minister Farrakhan, I was one of probably a couple of dozen people who were actually on stage with the minister that night. He had come the night before, stayed over and then uh, spoke at the, the ceremony for Encobra, the gathering there. It's a beautiful thing. Whatever you do or don't think about the nation of Islam in the social structure, guess what? I personally, Greg Kamathi Carr, I don't care. I don't care. In the governance formation, whatever you think about the nation of Islam, we should talk about that. Because for all of its complications and challenges, it also evokes a sense of unity and self-determination that can't be denied. And for those who have I think very important and trenchant and important critiques of the nation of Islam. I would encourage you, if you don't know about the nation of Islam, to learn something about the nation. You probably know some people who are in the nation. And if you're in the nation of Islam, I don't have to explain to you how absurd it is for people to write books and start talking about sexism and patriarchy in the nation of Islam. And every time I meet sisters like the one that I was in conversation with as we were going through security at the airport in Colombia, I think to myself, so you just stupid like everybody else who was a woman in the nation of Islam. Of course not. Y'all stop playing. I know too many sisters in the nation of Islam, Cali X in Columbus, Ohio, the great Abel Muhammad, whose uh, daughter just graduated from Howard back in the spring. My sister from Columbus, Ohio, now an ancestor. Christine Johnson, the founder of the Muhammad University of Islam in Chicago. I know, I know too many sisters in the nation of Islam. So you calling them stupid or naive? Get out my face. But we should probably, that's for the social structure. In the, in the governance formation, we should have a conversation. In fact, before you say another word out your mouth, let's go get some of them sisters and y'all have a conversation. And I'm just going to listen to see what we can tease out because it's complicated. But what we're not going to do is have a conversation as black face hand puppets of white supremacy talking as if you're in some kind of solidarity with us. That's out for me. But on Sunday, they went to church. And Rashida Tlaib was there because Rashida Tlaib sits in the congressional seat that John Conyers once had. I think it's interesting when we talk about African people in any context without knowing those people. Now, I'm not from Detroit, but I know a lot of people in Detroit. I spent a lot of time in Detroit. My, my Baba M. Zay is a newbie and he be in these streets in here. Baba uh, uh, um, Benachi Montgomery, one of the great students of Meta Nature, teaches Meta Nature, the great ancestor Abdullah Keel. Uh, who was a member of the Eye of Heru study group um, for many years. I love, of course, and my sister is from Detroit, Belithia Watkins, Belithia Ann Watkins, you know, all the time, all her family, Mama, Mama Gloria, who she and my mother were sisters, you understand? I mean, them Detroit Negroes not to be played with. I feel about them the same way I feel about them Chicago Negroes. These are my people, you understand? Rashida Tlaib has a lot of support in that community. That issue of Palestine is not a Palestinian issue. It's a human rights issue. And there are a lot of black people in Detroit who are not only behind Rashida Tlaib, they're in front of her and on both sides. And I'm not telling you what I heard or read about, although the, both of those things are important. I'm seeing what I've seen my own eyes. And so this stands up. There's never a good time. There's never a good time to do what people did in Democratic primary on Tuesday because we are playing with natural fire. But guess what? We've been playing with natural fire. And on foreign policy, the Republicans and Democrats are the same political party. And so I don't have an answer. If I had been there in Michigan voting in that primary, I would have voted uncommitted. But I am not going to vote for Donald Trump in November because I understand that the entire white supremacist apparatus of the United States of America and globally, including Israel, committing war crimes right now. Y'all see, shout out to Nicaragua, who now wants the Germans drugged before the World Court, the International Court of Justice, on the question of suborning genocide. Shout out to Nicaragua. I ain't mad at y'all. Why? Because all this fuck. Mm. 
I started saying funky border crisis, but ain't no border crisis. You know what the border crisis was? The border crisis was when these white nationalists crossed the indigenous people of the peninsula, the Yucatan Peninsula. The, the border crisis was when the Spanish came here in the 16th century. Ryan Coogler understands the border crisis more than all the damn experts simply by putting in Wakanda forever when the conquistadores came into that region. That's when the border was created. Please understand. You know what? What did I do with my bag? I had a bag that I just brought out. In, oh, here. This just came in mail. I subscribe to a journal that is published in France called The Phenomenalist. This is called, th this is number 51, un Undocumented international and there's a there's a there's a new this just came in the mail uh, a couple of days ago i love this article let me see let me go to 34 and i'm just going to show you all the title you might be able to find this online you could probably order it online let me see this is hold on a second this is the one on haiti uh yes this is an article by harsha walia harsha walia let me see if i can get it quickly it's, uh, yes. An internationalist front against border imperialism. This conversation recorded for the Phenomenalist podcast in April 2021. So they got a podcast. Y'all can, can hear this. Uh, Harsha Walia about the research deployed in her book, Border and Rule, Global Migration, Capitalism, and the Rise of Racist Nationalism, which draws an international map of the border imperialist regime in its historic geographic and legal complexities. Remember, we talked about this in the question of Palestine. We talked about Palestine a couple of months ago. They then proceed in trying to envision the various forms of internationalist solidarities that emerge in the struggle against this globalized border regime, taking cues from indigenous and or black resistance. I'm gonna read you a quote from the interview. For example, in the North American context, so many people from Mexico and Central America who are displaced from their lands as a result of ongoing colonialism and extraction and capitalism are indigenous, including Afro-indigenous peoples. Let me just keep going here for a minute. Oh, we're going to cook a little bit today, just a little bit. We ain't going to stay on here long. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic region of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations has its conference today. It's on Zoom. I got to go over there in a minute, too. But we're going to cook a little bit today. So, again, those borders were created by imperialism. Israel. Chef's kiss white supremacy. Chef's, chef's kiss colonialism, settler colonialism. This thing has gotten so hot that the damn New York Times and Time Magazine and all these other Forbes and uh, writing about settler colonialism. Why? Because you can't stop it. You can't, you, you can't stop resistance to settler colonialism. We have always resisted. I shouldn't be having this conversation in English, and you shouldn't be able to understand it. But but for settler colonialism, Israel's the last hill. Y'all going to die on this settler colonialist hill? Well, then let's dance. Because it's got to end, and it's going to end one way or the other. It's either going to be nuclear weapons. They had Navalny's funeral uh, the other day. It's his, it's his picture in the casket in the newspapers today and yesterday. Because Putin is trying to renegotiate borders that he say aren't real borders between the Ukraine and Russia. Why? Because you didn't drew these lines. Now you want to renegotiate these lines. I was reading the uh, the China Daily the other day. They pushing back against the United States. They always want to talk about Taiwan and Hong Kong. Damn it. You drew them lines. We're going to redraw the lines. Everything is about these lines in conflict. The lines in Africa. Oh, you drew all those lines and they got people at each other's throats because of those imaginary lines. And then you got people having to negotiate whether or not they're going to eat today or whether they're going to risk their lives to get some water because of these funky ass lines. But guess what, Israel, the hook, you will not escape the hook this time because those Guatemalans who have been victimized by your friend, the United States government, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, they're the same. There is a distinction, but not enough to make a difference on this issue. Foreign policy going to be the same. You see, your friends, Barack Obama, Jimmy Carter, your friends, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, your friends, George Herbert Walker Bush or Richard Nixon or John Kennedy or Lyndon Baines Johnson, your friends in the United States and their employees. Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense, everybody talking about whether he should have told the president he was in the hospital because he got prostate cancer. Sure, you should have told, told the president. You messed up, but let's not lose sight of the fact the man is the Secretary of Defense. And when Ro Kahana last week asked him from Congress and he's at the hearing, he said, how many Palestinians 
women and children have been killed. It wasn't about the prostate cancer. It wasn't about whether or not he should have told Joe Biden it was either the number he gave, 25,000. They shot a 16-year-old boy in the West Bank this morning. Killers, those, those people who were scrambling to get some food and some water that the IDF shot in the refugee camp. 80% of them were wounded with gunfire. You funky soldiers, you're using human beings as target practice Wednesday night in class. You know, I told you all, we're, we're, we're reading this book, Critical Race Judgments, rewritten U.S. Court Opinions on Race and the Law in my Critical Race Theory class, along with a couple of other books. Uh, an excellent uh, uh, book on critical race theory by Professor Kiara Bridges out there on the West Coast. But the case that one of the cases that we read on Wednesday night was Reno versus Flores. Jennifer Chacon, a uh, law professor, rewrote the, the case. This is about the children who had been brought to the United States and detained. And she rewrites the Reno case, the Flores case. And here it is. This is the rewritten case. You see, Supreme Court of the United States, Reno versus Flores. The case is concerns the liberty interests of children who have been are being detained by the United States Immigration and Nationalization Service, INS. These children pose no risk of flight, no threat of harm to themselves or others. Responsible adults are available to receive and care for them, but they are not, because they are not citizens and have no legal guardians who can claim them, they are currently being detained, often in troubling conditions, while the government determines whether or not they are to be deported. Anyway, she rewrites this to talk about why these children are at the southern border of the United States in the first place and why all the people who are coming are there. And what she starts with is the fact that the United States in being created lopped off the top third of Mexico, invaded the rest of the damn hemisphere. This is the Monroe Doctrine, friends. Do you remember? Do you remember? <laughs> when we fell in love we were young and innocent then yeah take michael jackson's remember the time and put it to white supremacy do you remember when you were in grade school and they taught you about davy crockett and george washington and the boston tea party and paul revere we were young and innocent then when they filled our minds with propaganda do you remember <laughs> when we fell in love with that funky flag, watching Johnny Tremaine movies, and, and then fast forward to Mel Gibson's crazy white nationalist ass watching The Patriot, and they put two Negroes in the film, and you cried a crocodile tear, because you think that you fought with George Washington because you love George Washington. You fought with George Washington because he gave you a gun, and the reason he gave you a gun is because the British promised you to. You were fighting for your freedom. Are you committed? What are you committed to? Survival and freedom. I'm going to work all this together in a minute. So at any rate, do you remember? You don't remember. The United States created the problem. These people are coming to the border because you have destabilized the places they lived in. And what Professor Chacon does is go through the history of U.S. imperialism in the region, particularly Central America. And so when she writes about how these countries coming out of World War II began to crawl out of this direct imperialism and began to try to create governments and elect governments that would serve their interests, guess what? The United States of America said, don't worry, United Fruit Company. Don't, don't worry, Dole. Don't worry, oil companies. Don't worry. No, no. We're going to destabilize any government in Central or South America that gets in the way of your business. Dick Cheney still walks the damn earth. Go ask Dick Cheney. Go ask George Herbert Walker. Can't ask George Herbert Walker. Ask his son. W, that, that, George W. Bush or Merrick Garland, who is the greatest beneficiary of affirmative action? I'll leave that to the social structure to figure that out in terms of failing up. One is the president of the United States, one is the attorney general. We victims of both. The problem is this, you dragging your funky feet, getting it close enough so the Supreme Court can do what they're doing with their white supremacist bench, which is say, guess what, Don? Don't worry about it. Beer Kavanaugh, come on. ACB, we don't know who voted to accept the case on whether or not he is immune. But we know there was enough of them, takes four. It was enough of them to vote to keep this mess going. Jack Smith asked him in December. Smith said, look, y'all rule on this very quickly. You think them people that he put on the court 
in the interest of the federal society and all them white nasties and every fucking fu white nasties in the country? Do you think they was going to go fast? Do you think Jenny Thomas, uh, holy Owen black boy toy was going to move fast? No, we got you, Don. Don't worry about it, baby. We got you. Because what we understand is by saying they are going to hear oral arguments at the end of April, that means they're not going to rule to the summer, maybe June or July. That means that any trial, if they rule correctly, and I can't see how they wouldn't rule correctly because every damn court has said he is not immune, including the D.C. Circuit 3-0. That means any trial won't begin until September or October. Oh, do you think it's going to be a day? Let me tell y'all something. This is how we work in this country where amnesia is the national identity. There is a national identity. They're going to forget all about an uncommitted vote in February. When the trial is on TV every day in September and October, and you know what might pull the mummy's fat out the fire? The fact there's going to be a trial on TV every day, and you're going to get to see what you get if you allow Trump to get back in the White House. See, you can't, you can't, you can't think about people as being informed. We're here week after week, day after day. Karen Hunter, you're on the radio every day in order for people to be able to educate and inform themselves and be in debate and dialogue so that we can string things together. But make no mistake about it. We live in a society of spectacle. This vote will be forgotten in September and October because that funky Supreme Court and thinking they're saving Donald Trump's behind might have actually made it worse for him because they seem to have forgotten that people forgot what happened yesterday, much less six months ago. Anyway, to the point I'm trying to make. Guatemala, one of those countries that was destabilized, they found their voice this week. And they went to the United Nations and said, drag Germany before the court. Why Germany? Oh, we making a point here. These people who were persecuted in Germany by the millions, murdered, slaughtered along with the Roma people who the social structure calls the gypsies, slaughtered along with African people, one of whom, African-American, got out with his life, the great Ernest Everett just from South Carolina. Th these people have a place for refuge and it's important to have. But let's be very clear. There is a racist sentiment at the heart of that settler colony that would not allow the people who are in the country called Israel to say, everybody should be able to vote. Everybody should be able to participate. We're not scared of you. Now, there are people who are in the place called Palestine who want to wipe Israel off the map. And they're not alone in the world. So the question becomes, can we get along? What are you committed to? A flag, a language, a country, or our common humanity? And can the two be reconciled? That is the open question none of us have answers for, but we must dialogue in order to try to get to a common answer. That having been said, that having been said, there are people in Israel that want to wipe out everybody, and unfortunately, so many of them are now in the government in charge of the guns. And your tax dollars at work are helping them. And Bibi Netanyahu is the leading candidate so far for mass murderer of the 21st century. And guess what? We are sick of it. If you are a human being, what are you committed to? Joe Biden said, Bob, said, you, I be a Zionist. You're committed to Israel, sir. But guess what? Donald Trump, you know what he's committed to? He's committed to Israel. No, he's not committed to Israel. He's committed to Zionism. No, he's not committed to Zionism. He's committed to himself, which means I'm committed to staying out of jail. I'll do whatever. And here's where the power of the people come in. Because there is no people power absent critical mass. And there is no critical mass without breaking some eggs. So what you then see is enough people around the world are pushing back. Should they have been pushing back in Congo? Yes. Should they have been pushing back in Haiti? You see today that uh, William Ruto, the president of Kenya yesterday, said that, okay, we got a thousand troops we're going to send to lead the UN invasion of Haiti this time. And guess who was over there? Ariel Henry, the prime minister of Haiti that the United States propped up. He was over in Kenya yesterday. I seen a picture of him talking in front of the Kenyan legislature. So let's be clear. What we are dealing with is geopolitics. And what we're not dealing with individuals. We're not dealing with personalities. We're not dealing with uh, both sideism. No, what we're dealing with is geopolitics where the states of the current European anchored formation is fracturing because one of the places they're propping up, then gone hog wild rogue, and it's just out here committing mass murder. And the people in the world, including people in those countries, is like, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, chief. The EU voting, 
The EU wants to send more support in. Macron and them trying to leave. But guess what? Macron and them making that noise. And some of the people in the EU like, hi, hold on, Chief. I don't know. Meanwhile, the people in the streets in France, the people in the streets in, in, in England, the people in the streets in the United States, the cities of the United States, the people are in the streets around the world. The Nicaraguans have said, no, Guatemala, have said, no, Germany, you of all people, suborning genocide? That's not a good look for you, Sieg Heil. I mean, sorry, that's not a, a, a good look for you, Germany, especially with them right wingers welling up in your legislature, in fact, on the plane on the way to Chicago, I picked up the latest copy of The Economist. You see the headline? The right goes gaga. Meet that global anti-globalist alliance. Make America, Hungary, Italy, France, Israel, Germany, the Netherlands, Poland great again. That red hat ain't just the United States, friends. There are real forces at work here. What are you going to be committed to? Voting uncommitted, in my mind, was an act of desperation an act of strategy that can be debated, good or bad, also an act of commitment, not being uncommitted. In other words, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice because Donald John Trump is a wooden figure. The hand up his back last time, scurried to get something together and you saw the, the havoc that they wreaked, the Muslim ban, which they perfected, by the way. But guess what? This time, that hand up his back, that punk cretin Stephen Miller and his boy who is over Project 2025, the Heritage Foundation, oh, they're not going to make that mistake again. They got the whole government plan in place, friends. And guess what? They ain't even trying to hide it. You can go to the Heritage Foundation website and download Project 2025. Make no mistake about it. I listened very carefully to Brother, brother uh, Don the other day. And I thought to myself as I saw the, the, the poster of my friend, the elder, Dick Gregory, over his shoulder, what would Dick Gregory say? Except I know what Dick Gregory would say. And I'm listening and I'm thinking to myself when Dick Gregory ran for president, you know, I talked to him extensively about that. In fact, write me in is right around the corner, my Dick Gregory show. As a Christian, his, his son entrusted me and Regina Brooks entrusted me to have conversations with him that would help reboot and start his memory, but emptied into that final book that he wrote on black history that came out just as he made transition. I wonder what Dick Gregory would say. I wonder, you know, what Eugene McCarthy would say, who ran for president. And then Bobby Kennedy jumped in. And of course the tsunami on the anti-war piece, you know, I wonder then, because that brought Richard Nixon back in 1968, and we have to understand that there is a white lash that is formed under Donald John Trump, and if we want to understand what's going to happen next in 2024, we might want to go back and look at the politics of the anti-war movement in 1968. We might want to go back and think about what happens anytime people come together for our common humanity. The white nationalists make another stand. This Trump presidency might be inevitable, it might not be inevitable, but what happened on Tuesday this break glass in case of emergency piece wasn't just about Arabs, wasn't just about Palestinians. I'm telling you, in the city of Detroit, a lot of black people voted uncommitted. And that most people didn't vote at all. And so the battle over electoral politics at the federal level in the United States of America in 2024 is could be won if we have enough commitment by people who will go out and organize the people who ain't going to vote anyway. But I'm going to tell you right now who's listening and who is moving as a result. Joe Biden. Because guess what? The night of the primary, he ain't say nothing. Oh, we won. But then he realized, and then the next day, he said, you know, I stand with the, many of the people who voted uncommitted. We're looking to resolve this. You're not looking to resolve this. You're you looking to arm Israel to the teeth, sir. But guess what? You can't get away with it because every day, more and more people build the critical mass. Is that going to deliver the White House to John Trump, to Donald John Trump? I'm not sure this far out that that's what's going to happen, but I am sure of this. If you commit to our common humanity, there's a price that's going to be paid. That price in the short term might be the presidency, but you're not going to do that anyway. Let's not be, be naive. The United States war machine is not going to back up until enough people overwhelm it. Remember, 
that's how Richard Nixon got back into power in 1968 after they murdered Bobby Kennedy. What is Nixon coming? Nixon comes out and says, I have a secret plan to end the war. You got the king warmonger with you, Henry Kissinger, who is now fully dead. But y'all had to end the Vietnam War. It's not in your political interest anymore, but you got everybody in the street, including your children. It's like, what the hell is going on? What I'm saying is that what we are committed to is pressure. Now, what that pressure looks like, and this is another reason why I praise and thank you, Prof. I thank you, Karen Hunter, because you're not going to look away from the complication. And even in the middle of a conversation where you're working out in your own mind, like we all are, what you're not going to do is silence people trying to have that conversation because everybody who has a dissenting opinion represents a bunch of other people who ain't said nothing who share that opinion. And the only way we get through it is dialogue. And so, you know, when we think about that, this fall, there's another collision between forces going on. This conflict will be won by who is the most committed, not the uncommitted. That was a vote in a primary on a Tuesday in Michigan where most people didn't vote. The vote is going to be won. The battle long range is going to be won by those who are the most committed. And Biden and Trump at the border right after that? Come on. Y'all heard that when I was reading from the Flores case, the critical race theory case, neither one of them doesn't believe in the border. The shovel mouth bastard governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, worried about building military bases to keep people out. You need to be worried about that one million acres of Texas that is on fire right now. If you are truly worried about the people of the United States, then you need to be worried about the fact that your state is on fire. It's on fire, sir. And I'm not talking about the flood, the, the, the caravan. Now, because you created that caravan in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. You created that caravan with the Contras and the Iran-Contra controversy. You created that caravan by assassinating leaders. You created the caravan by propping out right-wing nuts all throughout the peninsula. You created the caravan by pumping and allowing drugs into the United States. We talked about that in my hip hop class this week. Freeway Ricky Ross, not the current rapper. Rick Ross from California It's like, look, y'all, we ain't got no planes, we ain't got no cocaine, but they had the Contras, they bring it in, they get the money, they keep funding the Contras. This is Ronald Wilson Reagan, the gladiator invader of Grenada. This is what is what's going on on that peninsula. You created the caravan, sir, and now you got 13, 14 year old children they got to pick a side in a gang or lose their life or they're going to take their mama hostage. And so they come into the United States, not because they love this fucking ass settler project, but because they can't stay at home. So you want to talk about fire, sir? You and your punk ass friends, Ted Cruz and all the rest of you white nationalists. Damn it. Oh, we're going to dance. The only question is, what will be the tune that is being played? Will it be electoral politics in 2024 or is it going to be street warfare in 2025? So the only question we have to ask ourselves is which strategy are we committed to and which one is going to cause us the least pain and which one if we commit to it might reduce the harm. But what you're not going to be able to evade is the reckoning. That's what's going on in Israel right now. This was going to have to happen. And for all the white Christian nationalists, MAGA Mike Johnson in the federal legislature, and I'm sorry, Hakeem Jeffries, good brother. You can't prop this white boy up. You stand on a stage on the National Mall with this man who is a white Christian nationalist who loves Israel only because that's where the fight got to take place. You want to talk about an anti-Semite? You go into the clan adjacent white nastus of the United States of America. They only love Israel as a means to an end. And what they praying to ain't what you praying to. Trust and believe that, sir. So while you all are playing this game of U.S. foreign policy connected to the web of European settler colonial foreign, colonial foreign policy, that generated, when you read W.B. Du Bois in 1915, the African roots of the war, World War I, World War II, the resistance to which generated the Korean War, the Vietnam War, your proxy Cold Wars with your friends in the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union. While you play U.S. geopolitics, those of us who do the living and dying under these settler regimes that are fracturing as we speak must make choices. What are we committed to? 
in the past when we were committed to peace, they take your passport, Paul and Essie Robeson, W.B. Du Bois, and Shirley Graham Du Bois, Louise Thompson, Patterson, William Patterson, they take your passport. They try to hunt you down and put you in jail. They deport you, part of your Jones, from Trinidad through the United States back to England. They, they, they try to assault you. I'm for peace. You're a communist. Hell, the communists ain't for peace. Not all of them. So you have to understand that while we are in this system, we don't have to stay in the system as it is constructed, but we have to inform ourselves and find people who have common uh, interests and common awareness and continue to express, express ourselves and have communication so we figure out the best strategy. But we live, as you say, Prof, in a world where we don't think that far ahead. That's why I think the Tuesday thing is not going to make that much difference. So I think as we kind of wind up for the, for the day that, you know, one of the things that happened this week for me, it happens every time that I travel. And I'm really looking forward to the fact that this year builds on last year, which built on the year before, which built on the year before. It is communication, it is study, it is being in community and exchanging views, exchanging information that allows us to work our way toward resolution, more effective decision-making, our common humanity. It is the antidote to ignorance. I wanna end today with, um, and it wasn't Guatemala, it's Nicaragua. Thank you all both in the chat. I was just thinking about it because it just happened and I'm reading the papers and I'm getting back in the rhythm. We got a break coming up. You know, I um the, the, the week ended for me, it ends for me always and it begins for me on Saturdays here with us, which is a beautiful thing because the tragedy of COVID opened this space up and COVID allowed us post Corona in terms of the heart of the, of the fight. And they're still out there. Y'all we be careful. We had to take COVID tests to get into the, uh, to history makers, uh, work on Sunday and Monday. And I'm glad we did. Cause again, I tested negative again, but you know, I can't still can't hit them upper registers in the songs because I'm still feeling that low in my chest. And I've been assured that it's just taking time to resolve. And I'm like, yeah, I ain't tested positive for COVID the whole time I've been feeling under the weather. And I don't feel under the weather now, but I know my voice ain't coming back yet. So I'm still in the in the rest of you know that bothers me because every time something come on, I want to sing it. But at any rate, you know, I, I I being in South Carolina last week and then being in Chicago, which was just just a remarkable moment, and then going to Atlanta and spending two days with these history makers and these women and men who are bringing that work together, who are reminding me of the importance of the momentum of memory as we interview and sit with and listen to our elders. And what a blessing it is to do that. And, you know, coming back to be with the students at Dunbar High School, and I put in the chat the information for the, the bike, the bikes. In fact, I pulled it up on a computer. If y'all pull it up, you might be able to see it. Uh, I pulled in some couple of y'all people, a couple, couple of y'all did it. In fact, I, let me, uh, the, uh, both the art prime ability is the name of the, uh, the mountain bike crew. Uh, they have a hashtag hashtag stay primes, P R I M E. Yeah, not the guy in Colorado, uh, but stay prime prime ability. Those are the young people at Dunbar high school who make and repair bikes, who got a bike team that's open to the young people of the DMV. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. So y'all check out, they got a website, Prime Ability. I put it in the chat. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Hey, Prime, look at that. Did you see that? Oh my God. Look, these are, look, let's just take a second here and I'll end in a minute. What do you think about this? These are well, black children actually, from DC. Actually, I put it to the side because you know I'm doing something called Urban View Gives this year where I wanted to uh, highlight, you know, nonprofits that don't get all of the money from Mackenzie Scott and from, you know, the Ford Foundation. Uh, people that are doing things in the community, uh, like the Center for Law and Social Justice, which was yes. last month, the Read Daniel Favors uh, organization. And, um, you know, uh, this, this uh, I kicked it off with a, a brother who's um, teaching young Black boys to code. Yes. Um, mission yes. fulfilled 2030. By 2030, he wants to, you know, have a million of these kids involved in tech, which is the future. And so I'm looking at this. I wrote it down because I want to study it more, maybe invite someone on to talk about it because this is beautiful. 
Isn't it's it beautiful? <laughs> Isn't it's it beautiful. Just, just the images you're showing us right now? You see these yeah. kids? I mean, and I asked the young brother. I said the brother who runs it. I said, so man, how many of these young people knew anything about this bike and stuff before they came to Dunbar? He said, oh, Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna play a little. And that is like a 20, 25. <laughs> Okay. I mean, you gotta love that. He said, "None, none of them. They know about this, but in a short time, they not only learn it, they get to the head of the pack." But you show that little video there, you see people who you would say, "Oh God, these are the bikers. These are the guys who do trails." And then you see them dapping up two young boys with the A on. Where, where they come from? Are they from DC? <laughs> DC. I mean, and, and the beautiful thing, even in listening to this young brother, he was talking about how they're in nature. They're on the trails in Maryland and Virginia. They're out there. So it's not just bike. Like he said, it's bigger than bikes. Yeah, we learn yeah. about the environment. We're learning about all kinds of things. We're learning the science. Peddling towards hope. You got to love it. You got to love that. So anyway, and, and you know, and it's not just young boys, it's women and men. I mean, it's like, you know, it's not restricted by anything. And across um, Melanation. You know, we absolutely. Uh, we had Sam Reynolds in yesterday uh, for yeah. our our monthly astrology, but it's not really astrology. All of these things are entry points to find better versions of ourselves and to broaden our perspectives, right? And so we were having a conversation because yesterday was Harry, Harry Belafonte's birthday, and yeah. he was talking about his astrological chart and how committed he was to the liberation of Black people. And a lot of us want to focus on who he was married to or whatever, but. He said, I judge a person by what they do with their money and how they spend their time. How about that? And that that has to supersede everything. And, and you know, I would love to get out of the space to talk about black and white and all this other stuff because this made up construct of race is really silly and it's very debilitating to the furtherance of humanity. But we can't do that until we deal with the, the, the roots, that bamboo root that is crisscrossing everything until yeah. we pull that thing up and kill it, you know, we can't start to really talk about humanity because people are so tied to this thing called whiteness and so right. tied to this this pride in something that doesn't even exist. Biologically, it's silly. Master race. No question. No question. Of recessive genes. Make that make sense. Well, see, and that's where that's where you get that's where we get trapped because because it is race. But at the heart of race is whiteness. And so the, the people, you know, the idea that there is a kind of duality to this, we got to get rid of racism. Yeah, racism isn't an abstract concept. This has happened over the last five centuries. And it's because of whiteness that race emerges. And then once you've got that, it's exactly what you said. You've got everything from chosen people connected to race, connecting culture to race, to people exporting race into other cultures. So you talk about a North and a South Korea, you start talking about, I mean, you know, and I watched because uh, Roland actually live stream again, black media. I mean, Black Star Network live stream Harry Belafonte's ceremony yesterday. So in the middle of the night, I pulled it up, we watching it and I'm looking at, you know, it's the human community there. Spike Lee, Chuck D is there, Whoopi Goldberg, Anza Davis spoken. And then you see the children, you see particularly his oldest two children. I mean, just brilliant the way they talked about their activism. Then you saw the grandchildren and you heard his son talk very interestingly about, you know, the things that he loved about his father and then the things that he struggled with with his father. And you see that, and they all call him Harry, which lets you know it's so funny because, you know, you know, there's another kind of politics going on here. And, and did you hear the oldest? She said, you know, I am the oldest of five for, uh, uh, known children of Harry Belafonte. And then Sherry started clapping. <laughs> and then he said, including the new kid on the block. I'm going to not say anything else. Let the rest of y'all figure it out. So I'm like, wait a minute. Harry Belafonte got a child in the in the space. She laughed. Go watch. Go watch the stream. You Like you say, say less. She say nothing else. But I'm like, damn. I mean, but the point is, she then went on to talk about how she and her mother went out, they started this dance troupe in Africa, how they went out and did this work, she's doing something else, how all of us have taken a piece of this work because ultimately it ain't about nothing else but the work. And you know us by our work. She said what you said. And I think it's fascinating that you would say it the way you just said it, because that's what they were saying. Y'all looking at color, you're looking at, you got your opinions, everybody got their opinions, I got my opinions, don't matter. What did he do with his life? And what are we doing with our life? What are we committed to? That's what it was. And, <laughs> That's what it was. And, and this convening on Saturdays and beyond, 
you know, it's really about, you know, rooting out the racism in us, you know, in terms of the yeah. anti-blackness, because it's really anti-blackness. We, you know, we were clowning Alex Rodriguez, telling people to calm down because he got a tan. And we, we were having a conversation about Chile, you know, just frivolous you know, foolishness Friday type conversations. Um, there's a, you know, a clip with, um, uh, with Ocho Cinco and uh, Chad Johnson and, um, and, uh, Shannon Sharp talking about how, you know, Ocho wants to be so black. And he said, you already black. You so black. You leave fingerprints on coal. You know, you're doing the dozens and stuff. Oh, and yeah. like, all of this stuff has been planted in us to how we see ourselves and our, our, you know, what we deem beautiful, what we deem acceptable has been conditioned. And this work is to know the history and to take us back, 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 so that we're not standing on top of this made up thing that was designed to denigrate so that they can keep a power structure that always kept us in a subservient, less than position, as opposed to being the grandparents of That's society. Right. The roles have been flipped. We got That's children true. running the asylum. We got crazy Ooh. people running the asylum. You better teach. You better and teach. so, you know, we need to be of sober mind and, and get back to who we are. That's right. And then create the next who we are because we are something torn and new. We're something different. Mm -hmm. And right. so I'm, I'm just grateful um, as I keep my notes on Saturday. So many of you have notebooks full of, <laughs> uh, you know, points that you're going to go down a rabbit hole because Dr. Carr held up a book or said a name that you oh, didn't no. know. And that's the assignment. That's the assignment. And we're all responsible to do it. That's right. All of us. There's no escape of any of it. In fact, let me just, I want to end with this prop today and then we will we'll kind of transition out. Uh, we went to Frontline Bookstore in Chicago on Saturday on the way to the airport. There are very few black bookstores left in Chicago. Af uh, Frontline is one. They've been there for decades, 30 plus years. You walk in the storefront and it's just packed with books. I mean, books going back decades, books you won't find other places, books from the real black studies moment, which is the 1980s and 90s. I saw Kiari Cheatwood's book, The Race. I'm like, man, I got a copy of that book. It's in stores somewhere. I'm talking about Amari Obadelli, books by Amari Obadelli. You don't find Bob Amari's books anywhere. You know, I'm hoping all that will be brought back into print. I'm thinking about my friend in Kichi Taifa, who is uh, a newbie and, and, and in here often, the great lawyer, Black Power, Black Lawyer. If you haven't read her memoir, please do. In Kichi, in fact, this isn't her latest book, Black Power, Black Lawyer. This is the this is the memoir of our of our sister. In fact, um, comrade in Kichi Taifa. In fact, her latest book, I put this one here for now, is uh, Reparations on Fire: How and Why It's Spreading Across America. That's in, in Kichi Taifa. Anyway. Maybe uh, and Kishi can get that together. I think she's been working on some things. And then they republished one thing she did with Chokwe Lumumba and Imari Obadelli on reparations. But I saw those books on the front line. We said the elders is in, are in there. I come in, uh, Kim and I, we went over there. And the first thing I hear is that the cards. Hey, what's going on? I ain't been in, I ain't been in front line probably 10 years. And hey, man, we don't never miss you on in class. Tell Karen. You keep up the good work. Isn't it? Wow. I'm in Chicago. Deep on it. We, we passed the South. We passed Moss Mariam. We passed the Astor Gates' place, which was closed. I like to go by there anytime I can, you know, see the Astor's place and the mosque, of course. We done kept going. We kept going up in there. We go, man, what's going on, y'all? We talking. And then they start talking about what we be talking about on Saturdays. We talk. I mean, and I'm, it's a beautiful thing in that space. Um, Yesterday, and I'm going to end with this. Um, I'm going to talk about what where I was yesterday morning on Howard University's campus, which allowed me to spend the rest of the afternoon uh, with my friend Ayo Sakai, uh, who is the founder and CEO of a publishing company, the only academic press owned and operated by Black people in this country, and it's by a Black woman. Um, and in fact, I'll show you. I will show y'all some of her books because we're working on some things. In fact, I want to connect the two of y'all, Karen, because she's a she's strictly academic press. I mean, indexed with Sage Publications, the whole academic side. I'm thinking and this is why I was telling her yesterday. Yeah, we we got to connect you all because you know she's very close with and in conversation with Kasahun Chikoli, of course, with Black Classic Press, Baba Haki and Third World, and Paul Coates. At uh, I mean, at Paul, of course, at Black Classic Kasahun with Africa World Press, and I'm saying now. We get Karen into this conversation. See, 
what y'all understand is it's a wrap for white supremacy. Only question is how long it's going to take to get all the pieces together. Anyway, so we, we were there for several hours talking about some work that she's doing and the students were over there. You know, Howard students at spring break, but those who were in town came by. And just as I was leaving, some elders came in for a book event they had last night at Sankofa. Um, Dr. Halifu Osamare. Halifu Osamare is a is a force. She is a retired professor, professor emerita at the University of California, Davis. She taught in the African American and African Studies Court, uh, Department there. But more importantly, she is a cultural meaning maker of the first order. Dance is one of her major areas. She became an academic after a long career as a dancer. She was very close to Catherine Dunham. And she writes about Catherine Dunham and others in her journey, the first part of her life in a book called Dancing in Blackness. And I have Dancing in Blackness here. But in the moment when she came in, they came in, she and her husband, they went to the front of the store, to the, to the back of the store. They said it was setting up for a book talk. I didn't realize that she had released a new book until they started projecting what the talk was going to be about. And I asked my man Kamal at the uh, desk, I said, Kamal, what's this book? He said, oh, this is the new book that uh, Mama Halifa was put. This is the book, Dancing the Afro Future, Hula Hip Hop and the Dunham Legacy. She writes about her time with Catherine Dunham. But this is why I want to mention it. Because then, of course, I bought the book, went back, Answer to sign it. She signed the book. We started talking. I'm saying, so good to see that. This is what she said, Karen. Um, Dr. Halifu Samari told me to tell you that she listens to you every day. That she wanted to tell you thank you. And the key she and her husband said, you must keep up the good work. And she told us to do the same thing here. But it's important. I'm raising this because people, we have to understand that what we are doing together is connecting to what was already being done. You've been doing this for a long time, Karen. And it's allowing folk to extend into places and make connections that were already there so that we can become the community we need to be to intervene in these things in the world. Now, when I held this book up, a lot of people didn't know this book just came out. Uh, hula, hula, hula Hip Hop and the Dunham Legacy, Halifa Uzumar, University of Florida Press. By the way, shout out to the University of Florida for eliminating all diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, uh, jobs last week. Uh, everybody who got released gets three months pay and they, they get expedited consideration for university positions that are open. So I expect most of the people are going to keep jobs other places because they didn't have a big uh, diversity, equity, inclusion department to begin with. I heard my man Dave Canton on NPR, I think it was, uh, this morning talking about it. Dave is the uh, my former classmate. He and his wife, Roxana, down there. Um, Dave is the chair of African American Studies at the University of Florida. You heard me mention him when we were there last year at National Council of Black Studies in Gainesville. But shout out to U of F, because while uh, the pufferfish, uh, the failed presidential candidate, the footnote in history, uh, the illegitimate, uh, anyway, I'm not going to talk about uh, that fool anymore. The governor thinks that he won a triumph. You know, how much more before at least two or three of them football players say, I'm not playing football in the state of Florida because I would be in a, a diversity hire, wouldn't I? And now that I can take my name, image, and likeness, anything, anywhere I want, or maybe I'll come to Florida and play for Florida a and See, you had to understand what you're doing, white boys. Y'all are playing with fire because you're going to keep this up, whether it be Israel or Gainesville. You're going to keep this up until we finally remember what we did the last time. We had to punch y'all in the mouth intellectually. We had to punch y'all in the mouth politically. We had to punch y'all into the mouth in terms of social strategy and what to do. You have to understand that. But yeah, Mama Halifu wanted me to tell you, please. And I'm telling y'all now, in fact, let me just let you all know, because you might see the title, you might see the kind of catchy phrase. And I, just to give you a sense of who she is, let me just read you the cover here. Dancing the oh, this is her by the way. Let me just do the right thing. See, that's what black women do. We, we look good all the time. Do you understand what yeah. black women do? You see what I'm saying? She told me to tell you that, Karen. It says dancing the Afro future is the story of a dancer with a long career of artistry and activism who transitioned from performing black dance, cultural meaning making, ways of knowing, to writing it into history as a black studies scholar. Following the personal journey of her artistic development told in dancing and blackness. Halifu Ozumare now reflects on how that first career, which began during the 1960s Black Arts Movement, that's Baba Akili and Baba James Phillips at Howard, who are now going to connect to Baba Jackson and the students at Dunbar who did that artwork, Black Arts Movement, she's part of that movement, has influenced her growth as an academic, tracing her teaching 
and research against a political and cultural backdrop that extends to the 21st century with Black Lives Matter and a potent speculative Afro future. Osamari describes her decision to earn a doctorate in American studies from the University of Hawaii. She emulated the model of her mentor, Catherine Dunham, by studying and performing hula. And her research on hip hop youth culture took her from Hawaii to Africa, Europe, and South America. She's dancing Oshun in this in this memoir. And if you go to dance in black, she done danced every kind of dance there is. She was up under Catherine Dunham, the Dunham technique. So the time that Catherine Dunham spent in Haiti, I mean, come on, y'all. I'm just telling you right now. This is the type of scholarship that tells us who we are to each other. So the reason I was even there though at San Covid because I had spent the morning at Howard. Hmm, I don't have the program. It was Charter Day. Charter Day is the anniversary, March the 2nd, 1867. The drunken racist Andrew Johnson somehow mistakenly or ancestors guided him in spite of himself to sign the charter that created Howard University. And so they have a convocation. Yesterday's speaker was a fascinating figure in the history of Howard University, uh, a brother by the name of Michael Winston. Michael Winston is a very important figure. He co-edited with his mentor, Rayford Logan, the Dictionary of American Negro Biography. He's a major figure in terms of Howard University's politics, its administration, a uh, first-rate scholar, the founding director of the Moreland Spingarn Collection, and someone who I have a great deal of respect for and couldn't disagree with more politically. And that just goes to show you that you can have both. In fact, uh, I remember reading Michael Winston's article in Dadless the journal Dadless around 1971, uh, Through the Back Door is the name of it. It's a long article on black scholars in black spaces and how they were excluded from white institutions. Brilliant article. And I remembered that article about maybe 10 or 11 years ago when uh, myself, Dana Williams, who's now the Dean of the Graduate School, uh, we collaborated with the chairs of the College of Arts and Sciences under the leadership of James Donaldson and Sigmund Badagation. Uh, the dean and then the dean that followed him to create a Moreland Spingarn conference. Uh, it is. It was a very important moment. Many of the people who participated are now ancestors. Uh, Charles Bloxham was alive at the time, of course. Um, and and, and, and I, I remember in thinking about that conference, because basically I, I don't usually use first person in this, but I am going to take a moment here because I think it's important because things get lost, especially when you talk about Negro colleges. I'm the one that came up with that idea because we were in a chairs meeting and the young people had written in the student newspaper that Mourner Spingarn was in a crisis. It wasn't in a financial crisis as such. You I mean HBCU stay in perpetual crisis. But we sitting there and said, we should have a conference. Let's just stop this. We should have a conference about the importance of black archives, the importance of Mourner Spingarn. And so he said, okay, let's do it. We all got together and we, every chair had to take their department and either they do it or identify somebody to talk about the intellectual genealogy of their department. So we did the whole college. Then we brought in Gerald Horn. In fact, I said, I called Gerald. Gerald, we need you, brother, to, to open up the conference. But the, the night before the conference opened up officially, I'm the one who reached out to Michael Winston and said, brother, we need you to come because you were the first director of Morning Spin Garn and your article through the back door is very, he had been retired. He came the night before and opened the conference in Founders Library talking about the intellectual tradition of power. Very important. Uh, when we did W.E.B. Du Bois, the education of black people, Winston reached out and said, hey, how does one get an invitation to these kind of things? He's a Du Bois man. Sterling Brown and him were very close. But intellectually, I'm not intellectually, ideologically, we have a distinction, I think. Our distinction and our argument, which came to a head shortly thereafter, shit, it's been more than 10 years ago now. Oh, my God. That was more like maybe 12, 13 years ago. Uh, Sidney Rebo was president of Howard University at the time. He convened what he called the President's Commission on Academic Renewal. All over the campus, this 50-member commission that came together to debate and discuss what programs needed to go forward, forward what programs need, new programs needed to be developed, what's the intellectual thrust of Howard, how do we move it? And I was one of those commissioners. We got into a fight one day in the commission meeting about the nature of the graduate programs and what was the nature of Howard. That turned into a debate. And the chair of that commission, Alvin Thornton, now retired, brilliant brother, out of Alabama, uh, Alvin Thornton said, well, you know what? Rather than have that debate in this session, let's set aside a special session and the four subcommissions of the commission need to appoint somebody as their avatar and y'all get together and write up what the uniqueness of Howard is. I was picked as the avatar of the undergraduate programs and I wrote a, a paper on it about what the uniqueness of Howard was. And the thing opened up with Dr. Winston giving a history of Howard University, as only he can do. I agree with Ben Vincent, the new president of Howard, say he the one who know everything about Howard. Why did these Negroes, Professor Hunter, and everybody, why did these people 
<laughs> One day I come to work and they say, Daddy Carr, have you seen the poster? I said, what poster? Somebody brings me a poster, like a, a poster, like you put up for a concert or something. Debate on the uniqueness of Howard, President's Commission of Agony. On one side, it's me with my hand like this. <laughs> on the other side, it's Michael Winston looking up like this. I was like, is this WWF wrestling? I said, because clearly I represent the Black Power toward the Black University Pan African movement. Dr. Winston represents Howard University, the intellectual genealogy. It's not just a Black university, it's a university. Okay, y'all have set us up to beef. I'm big on intergenerational stuff and respect. Now, I do not agree with many of the things that this brother is talking about, but we have a conversation. One thing I respect about that cat, he's a first-rate intellectual, and I hope he respects that about me. But if he doesn't respect that about me, that would be okay, too, because as I often say, if he doesn't respect me in that regard, this that contempt is mutual. That we can we can do the other thing because see I ain't never afraid of a, of a battle involving books. We can dance any day of the week, but I think from being in, in experience with him that that's not the case. That haven't been said. Now I ain't gonna talk about the sneak stuff that I might write about one day because see we don't have a PhD program in African American Studies at Howard, and there's some reasons for that that I fully I'm gonna write about fully. So all you Negroes that have participated, oh please understand. That awful day for you will surely come. Anyway, that having been said, yesterday, Dr. Winston was the speaker. And no, that awful day will surely come. Oh, my God, you're going to be famous. So if you're a little nervous now, you should be fully nervous. You shouldn't be able to eat. Anyway, point is this. Or you could do the right thing. But I don't expect you to. And guess what? It don't matter because University Black, White, and Polka Dot is on the periphery of what we're doing. This work will be done in the community. Nubian narrative, all those things connected to Nubian narrative, those spaces where anybody can go if you ain't got no tuition, like DuSable Museum or the museum in Wilberforce, Ohio, where we will be back for the Delaney thing in May, or any of the other places in Atlanta, all those places in Jackson, Mississippi, or Charlotte, North Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, the Cecil Williams Museum. See, don't worry about it. The universities, that's a beautiful thing on the periphery of the spoke. The work gonna be done at Dunbar High School. Don't even, don't, don't worry about it. You're, you're okay. And guess who's gonna publish the book? And guess who's going to publish the book? You understand? We don't care. You ha Howard had a press, Professor Hunter, had a whole university press. Now Columbia running around talking about they're going to revive Howard University Press. How in the hell is your master going to revive your self-determined press? But guess what? You can argue about that out there in the hinterland. And if you want to come in here and talk, not a problem. In the words of Tevin Campbell, when you come to talk to us, can we talk for a minute? Go Just for a minute. Because you're not going to dictate the community's conversation. Anyway, so Dr. Winston was a commencement speaker. He spoke about four, I mean, the convocation speaker. He spoke about 40 minutes yesterday about the nature of Har uh, Harvard. Well, shit. That, my friends, was not a Freudian slip. Anyway, the, and he, he wrote, he, he evoked the question of holding on in a community. And I thought it was, a, I took notes. You know, I'm an inveterate note taker. I took four note cards of notes. I ain't seen nobody else writing. But I was writing the whole time because I want to understand even more the political dimension, the political dimension of what we face. The university, as we know it, is a place. The black university is a copy of the white university. The, on, the, the, the only thing that is different about historically black colleges is the is the thing that matters. And that's the people that are at them. They are not exclusively black. If you come into a historically black college or university, if you come into a black university or black college like Mega Evers or Chicago State, which aren't called HBCUs because they weren't founded prior to the time when that designation was created in the 1960s, or at least they, they, they're not historically black colleges in the sense that, you know, reconstruction and then the HBCU kind of label attaches to them. We have to understand that the population, the students, the faculty, the staff of these spaces bring into those spaces the cultural meaning making of African people, the ways of knowing of African people. The question is, and this is a question that was raised at Howard in the 1960s, like a lot of other places, and that was engaged by people like Michael Winston in a way that saw the value of this question of black memory, but differed in terms of where that type of intellectual work should be channeled. This question was raised, can a black university truly anchor itself in the self-determining intellectual genealogy of African people. This is what Du Bois was after in part when he's writing 
And when he's speaking, as we read in the education of black people, no HBCU has been able to answer that question in the affirmative because the social structures make it very difficult to even think that way. Although all of them have people who want to answer that question in the affirmative, but the structures make it very difficult. This isn't a critique. I've worked at black. I went to a black institution, two white ones, got my degrees from th two white ones. And in addition to the black one and worked at those institutions. And I went back to a black university because I am committed to do that. But what I'm not committed to is spending the rest of my life trying to force those spaces into something that they weren't built to do when we have an alternative. The alternative is to rely upon ourselves. And that's what this space is. And I just want to, you know, I, that's why I was on campus and listening to Professor Winston get right up to the edge and talk about the founding of Howard and, and, and the context of Black universities and the struggle to create this space where this work can be done and then emptying all that into the soul of America and emptying all of that into the idea that somehow this can be a space that can kind of save that soul and, and face the complicated challenges. I agree with everything except the narrow vision of what it means to be an African in the world, a vision that started with the origin of humanity, a vision that includes to this day, and a vision that can't be reconciled to a, a quick mention of Sankofa at the end of a speech, but one that takes very seriously the proposition that if we have an intellectual genealogy, we can reconstruct it like the people were doing at Dunbar uh, Dun, uh, at, at DuSable Museum on Saturday. And, and that's the kind of work that we have to do. And that's why we have to ask ourselves, are we committed? And I think the answer to that can be yes, but we're going to have to show it with our work, as you say, and not we're just talking about it. Ashe, um, I wanted to drop the mic like in, you know a while ago. Right, <laughs> no question. <laughs> no, as you as you're talking about that, um, I want everyone who's in the YouTube chat because we don't have to be live in the YouTube chat. This no, is no, not at all. something that Dr. Carr is committed to. Yeah. Hit the like button. It doesn't oh, yeah. cost you anything. Just do that. I mean, just hit the like button. Why? Because we're in a world that is driven by algorithms. Is driven. It tells us what we value based on what we tell them we value based on what we click on. So if you're here, 1,300 of you, there should be 1,300 likes. And if you're right. in Nubia, after we finish, come over and just hit the like button, go on about your business. Please. Because we have to, we have to be intentional about how we set and frame and create the kind of intention that we want to have and the kind of, um, uh, well, you know, we teach people how to treat us. This is part of that. Right. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Also, those of you who listen to me on Sirius XM, I don't do this um, because I don't do Sirius XM for for the attention. So it's always it tickles no. me when people are like, oh, you just uh, no, I don't really give a damn about being uh, seen famous, any of that stuff. This is a means <laughs> to an end. This is a conduit to something greater. Um, I'd much rather be sitting at home reading and writing. Um, but since I've been gifted with this ability to speak, I'm going to use that ability and this ability to think and to ask questions and to challenge people. And I have this kind of personality. I'm going to utilize that. So I'm going to ask all of you also uh, on social media at SiriusXM and let them know how powerful Urban View is, because I think they, they don't really understand. We're behind a paywall and we don't have ratings. So there's this notion that somehow somebody uh, who names themselves something ridiculous uh, has more political sway and can move the needle more more than Urban View. And Urban View uh, is, is powerful. And it's powerful because there was a vision coming in to make it such. This is a whole creation. Yes, Joe Madison was there before I got there, but I really thought about how we connect the dots and, and, and create an environment that pushes power and pushes ourselves to be better. And from from that six o'clock all the way through, there's a thread that's being sewn. And if you are valuing that, please go and be intentional and let Sirius XM know because there's a thousand stations that they have. And when you look at who they're putting and throwing their attention and money behind, it's not us. Even though I believe um, we have so much more. Um, and, and again, I'm not on salary. So that's the other thing, you know, so you, you're not impacting my, you know, my personal economy at all. But this is not about that. This is not about me getting a raise because I don't, you know, I don't get a salary from them. This is about the attention that we should be getting both on the app and out in the world. And we can only do that by making noise 
you know, just as Rashida Tlaib, you agree or don't agree, that had an impact. That uncommitted had an impact. Let's 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 have a commitment. So go on social media at SiriusXM. Go on social media at them and let them know Urban View was the bomb. Let them know that this is where you get your. This is the only reason why you have your subscription. We have to be intentional about that as well. So no, um, you no you question. inspired me to say that I wasn't going to because no, you know I, you, you know. I, I feel like people should just do that because they know, you know, if you, if you have something good, you want to share it, you know. And I'm like, come it's, on. It's long overdue. It's long overdue for you to say that. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we should be saying it more. Again, talking with Dr. Usamari and her husband yesterday, it's, it's I see everywhere. There ain't been no place in the last week where somebody ain't told me to tell you that. And multiple, you, you know what I'm saying? How many random texts and DMs I get from people that I'm shocked Listen, you know, that KRS one call was yeah. just was just, you know, there's so many. So I'm like, uh, yes, okay, if it's having that impact, um, hello, hello, y'all. Uh, what are we doing with the oh, y'all promoting something that ain't even are, are you serious right now? Like, uh, and we're about to make some other moves I'll let you know about um soon that will allow us to, to have even more of a footprint. But you know, in many ways, I this this space was created in understanding that eventually. Um, you know, we may need to have a space, uh, you know, if, if, if maybe sooner rather than later. I'm saying that project 20 say less, you yeah. gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna you know, say that though, because if if 20 if project 2025 has its way, mm. voices like mine will be silenced because oh, no, I'm be in, in violation of the edict that they have put down, right? Because I'm talking about race and I'm talking about, you know, these kind of issues that make people feel bad about themselves. And that's uh, against the law in some states, right, Dr. Right. Clark? So, I mean, I could see right. a world where, you know, there could be a petition because she's preaching, they, they call it now, I'm preaching hate. I said, so exactly. talking about racism is, now, now I'm racist, how does that exactly. work? Exactly. But the, this is how they are, they're, they're already crafting the language and all they need to do is codify it into law. And we are right. in several states where that's the case. That's so right. they, and they set it up. that's right. They said they set it up that way. They've been setting it up for 50 years. That's the that's Baki. That's everything moving toward this moment. People say, well, this is most important. Everybody says this is most important. When is the most the most important election of our lifetimes is the next one. Come don't on. uh, don't 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 act like it's it's not a game. So no, yeah, you, you, and, and I'm glad you said that. You know, we when, you know, we, we, we work in spaces that we have determined we're going to work in. We're committed to them. And for many years, you worked in a space at, at Hunter that was a multi-race United Nations. And you navigated that space. And still, the students will always be your students. You're always doing that work. You know, I work in a space that's majority Black. And that Blackness comes from all over the globe. And, and yet, it's very different than what we're doing. This space is a different kind of space, and the the open enemies. Wait, wait, wait. In my case, um, at that international school that had students from all walks of life, mostly melanated from different parts of the world, That's right. I was still the first black professor that they many of them have ever had. Unbelievable! In four oh, years. Actually believable, actually believable, and okay. and. That, and you're when, making, when, I, when I showed up to the faculty meeting and I looked around the table, I'm the only black woman in the room for. 20 years Gee. in a media department that ha has to service a community, a world where still 4% of the newsroom is black, right? There's something, there's something inherently wrong with that, you inherently know, ethically. Wrong. So inherently. yeah, yes, and, all of that. And, and, uh, and, and unsustainable because we're living in a world where that this system is on the verge of collapse and it has been for some time, but what you're describing is untenable. And people are pushing back, whether it be Hunter, whether it be Columbia, whether it be Howard. I mean, you know, the thing about this Palestine issue is it isn't that there isn't stuff going on other places that is just terrible. The Sudan right now is, Congo. I mean, it, the Congo, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and in those spaces, it isn't that those things aren't going on and that we shouldn't connect those spaces. We should be against it all the time. It's that this has captured the attention because it is one of the, to, for lack of a better term, maybe this is the better term, it is the Achilles heel of white supremacy. And so this system has to work overtime to prop it up. But in working overtime to prop it up, it is laying bare its commitments. And in doing that, the folks who resist it are now finding their voices. So it has the unintended consequences of not tamping things down. I mean, you saw, I'm sure you saw, you may have even talked about it. 
uh, Christine Amapour. They had a meeting in England the other day, maybe yesterday, the day before. It was in the, it was in the Financial Times, and Amapour is on a recording that they leaked to the Intercept, critiquing CNN. And said, "I got problems. We're not covering oh, this thing." Oh, we knew we knew they had problems because she spoke out at a at an event. <sighs> yeah. She, Listen, months before when they had gone through that whole shakeup, do you remember? Yeah, she was like, yeah I do. I do remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah no, I don't agree with this. <laughs> so, she, you know, yeah. so it's, according to the report, for those who heard, I guess the intercept is on their webpage. She waited until the end of the meeting. It was almost like all these other staffers, you had Arab staffers, for example, at the Jerusalem uh, Bureau, because CNN is running all their coverage through the Jerusalem Bureau. And they said, we can't even go to work. My family looking at me like, what? And they said, no, we got to stand. No, no, no. And then finally at the end on the recording, apparently, Christine Amapour is the one said, hey, look. Just, I, and you can imagine she's giving cover to those young reporters and to those reporters who are afraid about their job. I mean, and this was the, the, the CNN top brass went to England for this meeting. And they said, we can't keep doing this. And, and for everybody that is, you know, um, I, I have people on my show that have contracts with these people. Mm -hmm. And so I recognize when they come on, you know, their allegiance is to their paycheck, you know, and then sometimes they forget. And but it's it's your responsibility. I felt that way when I was at the Daily News. That mm -hmm. was my responsibility, whatever it, the cost was to challenge. And it's how you do it, you know. Um, you know, the battle royales that I fought in those in those rooms on the editorial board were epic. Right. But it's because I had a relationship with the people in those positions where and I was valuable. Right. So so when you are a, a person who is valuable, you have to press the power because sometimes they just don't. They're just operating. Yes, they have board, uh, you know, board members that they have to answer to and shareholders and all this other stuff. But at the end of the day, nobody wants to really be wrong. No question. <laughs> no oh, question. Well, you know, so. And, 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 and if we're surrounded by people who are so tied to their checks that they will say anything to keep that check as opposed to challenging the power in the room, what's your purpose there? Because we don't need you to just collect a check and look pretty on television. That's right. I mean, make make some make a difference. That's and if right. you don't have the capacity to, because that's the other thing, some of y'all are in these seats and you don't have the capacity to even make a difference. You're just there because you speak well and you look good. Right. You have no depth. And no right. substance, but yet you're able to petition for things to get on television mm -hmm. because you speak well and you look good, but you're not doing good. That's right. I'm you're sorry. Not... I, I'm on no, no, no. Please don't apologize. Right. This, is where, it, but... look, this is where we needed to be. This is the question of committed. And we got committed people in this space and we're building. And that's a beautiful thing. And like you said, thanks. Thank you. I can't. Again, I know you say, you know, it's all of us and it is all of us, but you architect, you're the architect. You saw this and you and then you stepped out. It wasn't out your mouth, it was with your feet. It was it's with your feet. Dr. Carr, because yeah. we need a place to be. So we need a place to be. That's right. And and now we are in a, on the verge of the next iteration of it. And and so I um, you know, I'm I'm excited about the upcoming months, excited about all this stuff. And like you said, as folks begin to be aware and contribute to this space in all the ways, it's gonna, I mean. It's it's life saving. It's life saving. People say that too. I had a brother in Chicago say, "Man, this saved my life." A young brother in Columbia, South Carolina, said, "This say." I mean, you know, were you saying that literally? I'm saying just being able to be able to be in a space where I'm not crazy and I can learn, and we can learn from each other, and I can say something about it. It's yeah, I can say that for myself. Can sure. I say that? Please, say everybody that's in Nubia right now saved my life. You know, mm. like. It, it's one thing to have a conception of a thing and then to put it out, but for people to buy, to not just buy into it, but participate in ways that I couldn't even imagine. And it's, you know, I don't even ask for all of the things that people are doing, just doing just because it is in their soul to do. It it gives me so much hope that I know, no, that we're going to yeah. get through whatever. I know, no, we're going to get through whatever's coming because of who comes with us every day. So Absolutely. I just want to say thank you to everybody that has made a commitment to not just join us on a Saturday, but y'all are there. I mean, they're there. I don't even know when y'all work because uh, <laughs> I'll be in the chat with Marie. I'll pop in the same people be there from three to six. Uh, yeah, listen, listen, listen. y'all got some good jobs. Well, y'all are, but this Maybe is a job. 
You know, they're, they're, working, they're, 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 they're in Nubia working, you know, and I love no it. Question. I love no it. Question. Don yeah. Callaway just joined too because he, you know, oh, excellent. Um, yeah, he's in and uh Nubia's troll him, and I love that too. So there's oh, like you know, that's there's, important. We need yeah, to have them conversations. It's a beautiful thing. So yeah. you know, shout and, out and to we can have more of those conversations in, in Nubia. We need to have those because it's not debates, as Marie Bakelsey said, we try to agree to agree. We want to agree to agree. And you're right. People, look, when I saw Felicia and Jerry walk in and they came at the end and you saw them there as we were going through DuSable and they were on their way to the teach-in, Felicia and Jerry were with us in Kemet. And they stayed. They came Friday night. They came back Saturday all day. I mean, these are people, you know, their daughter, uh, Felicia's sister, Mama Mavis. I mean, they're all in this space. And so, yeah, I mean, and, 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 and you yeah, know, I do want this. Don't go anywhere. This, this is like 30 seconds. I wanted to mention this and, and I'm glad it came to mind. You know, our freedom fighters, our liberation warriors, those who are still with us, you know, they've paid a heavy price. Mumia, Mumia Abu Jamal is, you know, his health has declined terribly. He's still, they give these they give these people death sentences. Asad Shakur had, his, had to be out of the country. Your mother passed, us kind of thing. And uh, Mama Dory Ladner, who we talk about all the time here, you know, she had a stroke. She's had some challenges. She's in an assisted facility. She wants to come home. Uh, the SNCC veterans, all the people who are still around in SNCC. Are raising money for her. I put something in both chats while, while we're talking because they're trying to raise money for. I mean, this she was a social worker. She worked at DC General for years. She's been around the world. This is a sister who risked her entire life. She and her sister Joyce and all their comrades for us, not for an American flag, not for American democracy, for Black people. And it transformed the way that we are able to move through the world. And you say to yourself, if everybody does a little, nobody has to do a lot. That and, 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 you, know, you, know and you also say. Uh, individuals don't be institutions and we have to build institutions. we have to build institutions so that there's always going to be a place Teach. for a mama Latner where where she will never have to ask anybody because I've said this to you before nobody should have to work this hard and do so much and look up at the end of their life towards Come the end of their life and need something and it not be there for them there none for of them. our freedom fighters should be in that position and uh, unfortunately too often the shiny bauble you know, is out there while the people who are doing the work end right. up broke and busted at the end of their lives and not on my watch. So I said this to you, that's part of the underlying, that's, a, you know, it's not even a secret. It's an you underlying it. and, <laughs> you know, is why we build everybody complaining about different things. No, this is why we do it. The, where's the money? Well, the money's going to build institutions. How long do you think it takes to build an institution? And this is, this is a quiet thing you know this is a thing that we do brick by brick but yeah i mean you know that's why i love i see i see the latest iteration in the line is say less you've been you've been rocking versions of that joint yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, 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 very. <laughs> you know um it'll be it'll be here uh i think next week we're, we're gonna drop it, no, did it drop I, on say less. It, originally you know i was gonna use an icon symbol because i wanted to start bringing in some of the things sure. and I, I i didn't want to be disrespectful you know and and, exactly. and diminish the value of those symbols because it can't really be captured in a word. So I had sure, to go sure. back in the lab, you know, like, but all of that's thoughtful, you know, that I probably wouldn't have thought about five, 10 years ago before I met you, you know no, what I'm saying? No, like, no, so no, now no. I'm, I'm considering what this looks like a hundred years from now to put a symbol on, on garment that means so much more than just a phrase, mm -hmm. you know, so thank you, thank you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We we went a full yeah, hour. It's all right. Like, oh, it's all right. We we're not, we we're, not, we're, we're not gonna do that. You know, <laughs> we we've been trying to move the other direction. So I'm sorry. We we had a lot today, but yeah, but yeah, listen, I love you and okay. love everybody, and thank you all. And we'll we'll see each other next week. All right, Doctor Carl. Okay. Monday night, Monday night office hours. We're gonna finish the process and the Du Bois stuff. So right. if you got a subscription, come on in now. All right. All see right. you. Love you. Love you too. Bye.